everyone. We are here with you at the Learning Salon. Welcome. As a reminder, the Learning Salon is a forum where we discuss uh, the biological and uh, artificial approaches to learning, uh, their bridges and their contentions. It's an interdisciplinary space. So if you have uh, questions about a particular thing, you can always ask us in a chat, discuss with everyone. Students and junior uh, researchers are very much welcome to ask their questions either in the chat or in the ask a question area. There are no bad questions unless they are this, uh, you know, disrespectful. As long as you're respectful, there are no bad questions. We encourage even disagreements as long as they are expressed um, as sort of uh, with respect. Uh, we are extremely excited today uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, the learning salon reason of it all being that we have uh, Dr. Bujaki with us. Uh, Yuri is not a, a unfamiliar name to anyone in the field of neuroscience. I remember I was a grad student when I uh, saw Rhythms of the Brain and I was looking at uh, the Bujaki Labs uh, work. And I remember that when I was doing fMRI work, uh, everything that uh, came out of the Bujaki Lab was so exciting. And I was like, oh my God, I need to learn more about this. And so when I got to actually do modeling and computational work that related to the hippocampus and navigation, I felt um, uh, even uh, more excited every time there was a paper out of that lab. I left a, a link to the lab in the Twitter post, so you can all take a look at that and take a look at their lab and uh, everything that they've had today. Uh, I'm very excited that we're, I'm guessing we're going to talk a little bit about the content of this book. This is um, um, The Brain from Inside Out, with a wonderful cover. Uh, this is the most recent book. Uh, that um, I'm assuming that the pre-configured brain has something to do with it because that's the main thesis of that book. And yeah, I, in other world, uh, other daily news, I, I am a, now a homeowner as of today in New York City. So that's exciting. That's uh, <laughs> another reason that today is a good day. Um, all right, with that, uh, usually uh, we do very informal introductions. So this is my informal introduction, but John, do you have any informal introductions that you would like to provide? Oh, you're, you're muted, so let me unmute you. You're unmuted now. I'd like to second what you just said, that it's really fantastic to have Yuri on. Um, I've had the honor to debate Yuri and to go out with him and to have back and forth and uh, Yuri, I think, is um, that, you know, interesting type of neuroscientist the field very badly needs, both obviously, no need to, for me to say it, sort of brilliant experimental work, but also a real bird's eye view of the whole field and where it's gone wrong and where it needs to go. So sort of an intellectual and an academic. And uh, I think it's, you know, the kind of content in that book, for example, is precisely what we've been debating for the last two years almost of the Learning Salon. Not two years, but it feels like two years. Um, and so it's really great to have you here, Yuri. Thanks so much for Thank talking you. to us. Thank you. Should I go? Yep. Please take okay. your way. All right. So I thought, you know, this is a salon, which means that it's a, it's a leisurely conversation with some drinks in your hands. And then we walk around and we bump into each other and ask questions that otherwise we wouldn't there to ask when it would be a formal conference. So in such a salon, I'd like to ask, uh, discuss three questions. The first one is uh, something that I'm particularly interested in, namely how neuroscience got its current framework. And this is important because the framework guides your thinking, the framework guides your experimentation. And of course it has something to do with, lim with language and the whole thing about your mind. The second thing is that once it's on your mind, you know, how did cognitive mechanisms evolve from very simple brains and uh, to the level that we have? And the third related issue is, has something to do with the first two, is that, as you will see, I argue that current thinking in neuroscience or the way how we design experiments still follows a blank slate model. And my antidote to all of these things will be action. By action, I mean muscular activity, um, endocrine function, autonomic function, but also I consider the thought as an action, maybe a delayed action, but nevertheless it is. 
So let me just go to the first issue. Of course, you know, neuroscience didn't start out with the brain. It started out with, 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 with layman thinking about where the psyche comes from and how the psyche works. And then uh, later on, it was the soul. The soul became a pacified version of the mind. And then it took thousands of years until we got here. But along this long journey, we made up a, uh, a framework that works something like this. Namely, that the reason why we have a soul given to us by God is to learn about the truth of the very difficult nature of the outside world. Therefore, we were given the critical uh, sensors, such as vision uh, and, and several others, to observe the world and learn about its beauty um, and the dangers out there, somehow with the help of our complicated brain, we have to evaluate the good and the bad and make the good decisions. And if you do make the good decisions, then you go to heaven. But of course, along the way, you need to find a mechanism somewhere, not a mechanism, but some uh, imaginative process in our mind or in our soul that allows that the good and the bad is separated from each other and generates an output. And you know, it doesn't really matter how you twist and turn this in many religions thinking and usually layman thinking, this echoes in every single uh, culture. And the, the problem of course here is that between the output and the input, there are this imagined, very complicated, spooky stuff that we can call it, you know, if you're a computational neuroscientist, you can call it a black box intervening variables, information processing, or you can go all the way down to decision-making and free will. Well, my antidote, my other alternative to this uh, inside or the outside in approach or input output version is that we should start with the, the brain. We should start with the mechanism that can generate an output. And that's the primary thing. The, the, unless you can generate an output, there is no point to have an input. There is no point seeing something if you cannot act upon what you have seen. So sensation is, is sort of a, even though it looks like a, a, a circle, for me, the primary thing is action. And the main goal of the brain is, of course, is to control the body and through the body control to predict the consequences of the output that the brain generates. Now, it is, of course, very number of consequences whether you approach a difficult problem from one direction or from the other direction and, and this is what's written here now just to tell you a very simple problem and maybe this is the thing that started me thinking about all this thing that if you would like to find a uh, correlate in the brain such as a place field then you find it you describe it you publish it and then you try to explain it to others. The problem is that in order to understand what is the brain correlate of place of the place field, you have to embed yourself in English language. Because if you are not an English speaker, then you define this thing in a complicated way, depending where you come from. There are many different ways, and you can see some of them are quite elaborate, because what seems to be a simple thing in one language is a complicated matter in another one. So maybe that's not so, such a good idea that what we do today in neuroscience is that we take it for granted that those terms that have been concocted by smart philosophers, psychologists, and other people, and then we believe that those exist the way how they are with boundaries, and we are looking for corresponding parts or homes in the brain and corresponding mechanisms. And this is the approach I suggest to confront and maybe find an alternative. So this was one big territory that I'm sure you are already sharpening your knives and, uh, and preparing your guns. Uh, so I, the next level is a little bit simpler, namely how cognition e emerged. And my claim is that cognition is an internalized action. What do I mean by that? So let's see a very simple organism. I don't know if you see my cursor 
on the left side, there is a simple brain whose goal is to predict its actions. And whenever it happens, then it can act upon it. So it, the output is reflected with the help of this circle. And the circle is, is closed by the external environment. These are the affordances that Gibson talked about. Now, with time, with evolution, this input-output relationship becomes a little bit more complicated. The brain adds more and more and more and more loops. But the whole goal of this complexity is nothing else, just predict the same thing, but now let the organism to predict the future at a much longer time scale and in much noisier, much complicated environment, such as ours. And this is almost cognition, but not quite. What requires for cognition is that we disengage the brain from the external world is because when this middle brain, the complicated brain, is already doing something, then seeing, for example, is not seeing what's outside there. What we are seeing is the computation in our visual brain. I close my eyes and I still see the world around me. So if that is the situation, that indeed we can disengage the outside world for all. Yuri, Yuri, it's, I'm sorry to interrupt. Is there any way you can click that crowd pass bar hide. at the bottom of your hide? Okay. Yeah. Is better? Uh, or did I? Because a lot of things disappeared in my screen. If you go back to uh, the PowerPoint, it would be great. So just if you go back, okay. click on the yellow and the. Is it good now? Yeah, yeah. great. Fantastic. Perfect. Okay. So this will be the second big chunk of things that we'd like to discuss. And just to give you an example for that, for this internalization, I go to my favorite thing, of course, is the relationship between navigation in the physical world and memory in the inside world. And many of you, even the younger generation, might remember or at least realized or, or thought about it that, you know, one group of scientists says, say that, the hippocampus is all about navigation. Other people, equally bright people, they say, no, no, this is all about memory. And then there is a lip service between the two camps and say, oh, probably this is uh, interesting. All you have to do is give time to this and so on. I don't go into the details, but the interesting thought about this that indeed nature gave the opportunity for the brain to navigate with the help of the external environment but then through internalization it equipped the brain to do the navigation internally and as Enver Tulving would say we can travel back to the past mentally and we can go into the future I can call the previous one postdiction and the other one is prediction and it turns out that it's exactly the same substrate or almost the same substrate that is responsible for both you cannot predict without postdiction so this, of course, is a favorite part of my story because memory is exactly the kind of problems that one has to face when you are coming from the ancient history. When we started, not we, neuroscientists, started to work on problems like memory, then this is the definition we usually get. You know, memories come in two flavors. One is everything else and the other one is what we can verbally declare and it, it is called declarative memory and if you accept that then we are doomed to failure because i cannot talk to my rodents so obviously this language based or introspection based definition is a huge problem in many fields of neuroscience but in memory it is a particularly one and Below, you can read the sentence, we have an alternative to how to deal with this. And we can come back in the question and answer period to that. So here is the, the definition that was given to us, you know, neuroscientists that say, at least if you would like to interest, if you're interested in the most exciting type of memory, which is episodic memory, you have to define it. And the definition is here, what happened to me, this is a no totic uh, assumption, uh, where and when. And this is an extraordinary, fantastic uh, simplification 
because instead of storing every single event of my life, we just have to store in separate boxes the what's, the when's, and the where's. And then reconstructing from the marginals, we can always go back in time or, or travel back in time or into the future. But of course, when you think about this for a second, you said, well, there is a problem here that, that this is Newtonian neuroscience because the where is a big container, according to Newton. Space is a big container where, into which we put things in. And there's a time arrow, and that gives you a timestamp of the events. Now, brains do not make time or space. Space and time are categories that, according to Immanuel Kant, are independent from each other and independent from everything else. They are immaterial. In other words, they cannot have an impact on anything, not even the brain. So the brains don't sense either time or, sp or, or space. So this simplification, this roadmaps for neuroscience, that is, you know, you have to study the what, you have to study the where, and you have to study the when. And with the, the naming of the hippocampal pyramidal cell, cells as time cells, we thought we were almost there. But this is when I started my thinking's reset that this is just, this cannot be right. And, you know, from in this framework, what you can say that, you know, it makes a lot of sense because episodes are a segment, it's a trajectory in technical words. It's, you know, in, in computation, you can say there is a trajectory of space and time. And then when many trajectories intersect with each other, then there is a frozen event in time and space, and that's the semantic information. But even the man of street knows this statement, but the neuroscientists just don't listen. And if you go back and look what these terms mean for different cultures, then they are basically two divisions. One says, well, nothing is new under the sun, everything is recurring, or the other one is nothing ever is the same, everything is just an arrow, it moves forward. And you know you can say this is exactly the same, but but as you know, many different religions are, are based on that and beliefs and, and frameworks. And this is what neuroscience is trying to figure out. And uh, I don't think we will because we are searching for something that the brain has nothing to do with. And the other major part in this field or interesting thing was it's not about just uh, you no know, triangulation or, or trilateralization of the environment that allows you to. To determine your own position. So it's not only about perception, but but navigation is as an active thing. It's an action. You have to translocate and so on. The only way how you know, for example, that a stick in the water is not broken is you know, no amount of inspection will help you. But the start you but the moment you start moving it, you immediately know that uh -huh, it's not broken. So this is where the value of all this uh, thinking about action comes from. In short, calling these cells by different names. And I have a whole list of things, you know, you, you probably have witnessed that these days people like to give names. In, in the entorhinal hippocampal system, there are about 100 different terms that just popped up over the past five years or so. Uh, because when you name something, you have the, <laughs> the false feeling that you understand something. You know, I used to jokingly say that if you don't understand something, the best thing to do is make up a word or two and pretend that those words which you don't understand explain the thing. And this is impact, in fact, is a big problem that we always mix up the things that we would like to explain with the, with the explanandum, that is uh, what explains and what is to be explained. Uh, I can go through this a little bit quickly because uh, I'm supposed to just summarize these things. Uh, but what I, I'd like to say is that if we go away from this synthesizing brain that is a white paper and everything has to be built up from scratch, then it's, uh, it will be more complicated than, than needed. Maybe there is another approach to this and the simplification is there, assuming that there are many, many things that are given to us either by evolution or God or by other solutions. 
and somehow we never ask or we don't ask in neuroscience the relationship between the two. So we, we started thinking about it a little bit more, more forcefully and said, you know, why are there certain things that are so universal in neuroscience and we don't have a good answer to? And one of them is this law, you know, neuroscience has very few laws, unlike physics, but we have one at least, the wave effect law that nobody ever violated and it it just gets expanded more and more and more to different territories, including memory and uh, space perception and time perception and so on. And we would like to know what are the foundations of this. And uh, one area of research that we contributed a little bit, as well as uh, working on hard, that showing that almost everything in the brain that is related to dynamic in individual uh, uh, neurons and population activity, they all show a very strong skewed distribution. There is a brain is a very non-egalitarian structure. And this non-egalitarian uh, skewed dynamic is supported by a very strongly skewed anatomical substrate from macroscopic, mesoscopic to microscopic levels. Now, if this is the case, of course, then you can say that learning is not writing in. An alternative thing to writing in is what you can call unmasking. It is like the brain is a Chinese dictionary that many of us don't really understand. But if we can ground the individual symbols with experience, then the symbols begin to make sense. So your brain, my brain, and brain of Albert Einstein is probably not more complex because the amount of experience that we have doesn't make the brain more complex. If it would, it would be just like current AI or most of feature, or most fields of AI where you put a lot of information in and sooner or later the whole thing collapses. It's uh, called catastrophic interference. My brain and your brain doesn't experience catastrophic experience save when you have a huge brain trauma or something like that. So just to say something concrete, I'd like to show you two experiments. One of them is an interesting thing, namely that hippocampal cells are place cells. We record from them and we find that 20%, sometimes 50% of the neurons we can account for what they do in a given experiment. The other half or other 80% sometimes we have no clue. The reason why we have no clue is because they fire just like this. So here the animal is going from the beginning to the end of a track. And sometimes there is a little bit of firing, but it has nothing to do or very little to do with where the animal is. So in contrast to these other cells, one, two, three, four different colors, play cell, this, this yellow cell is just uh, useless. But when we fall asleep, then the same cell that was almost virtually silent and many silent cells just start spiking. And we would like to know what the heck they are doing. Are they doing something that is not relevant to this particular task? And what would happen if we would be able to ask a question from the neuron, namely depolarize it or change the membrane potential and said, if you spike, where would you spike? So this is what we can do with the method that we introduce now. It's called the fast pulse optogenetics. You know, 10, 20 millisecond pulses are given at many, many places for hours. And then they, we make the neuron spike. They have the help of this uh, micro LEDs, which are size, they have the size of a neuron. And then what we find is that this cell and this other cell that were silent and they didn't tell you anything about what they like to be tuned to, they express a place field. And this is what we can call unmasking we were able to unmask a pre-existing place field. Moreover, when we have pre-existing place field, unmasked pre-existing place field, they also have a sequence. And these sequences will be replayed during sleep in pretty much the same sequence as the replay of real play sequences. What is the implication? The implication is that at any moment in time, the hippocampus is not thinking about time, space, memory, or anything. It's just blind. It, and every single neuron that is participating in something in a moment, it is part of the same attractor. And 
if you depolarize neurons more and more, then you will relieve, uh, you, you, you find that their contribution is indeed to this particular one thing, that one attractor. Uh, this is just showing the, the quantification. The other way to think about it is that, you know, it's not the other way, the continuation of this is where do these pre existing connections come from? You know, the, the slogan, the current slogan in neuroscience, starting with Donald Hebb and then other people bought in, saying that, aha, uh -huh, neurons that fire together, wire together. And enormous amount of effort has been spent on it. But we have done some experiment that don't exactly confirm this idea. We see the opposite. Now, what is the opposite? What we do here with Roman Hussar is that at different stages of intrauterine development, you can mark the neurons for life. So at embryonic stage, 13, 14, 15, 16 days. And then when the animals grow up in the adults, you can go and ask how these neurons behave related to other neurons. Or even a simpler question is that those neurons that were born together in the same day, do they show similar cognitive features and other physiological features? And do they participate in the same clubs and parties and so on? Or cell assemblies more than those neurons that were born on different days? And the answer is, yes, if neurons, if for example, in the lower left, you can see here, it's a complicated thing. So I just tell you, namely that those neurons that are born together very likely have place overlapping place fields in any environment you can take the animal from one room to another room another room and the maps are distorted and 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 and, and reorganized completely but not perfectly completely there are constraints and that's my point and those constraints are even stronger for those neurons that are born in the same day and this is just quantified here so we end up with this interesting picture, which is that the brain is a kind of a spaghetti when it comes to dynamics. And what you see here in the spaghetti, there are these thick lines. And these are the lines that I imagine have a meaning to the organism because those were already matched by experience to something interesting in the outside world. So rather than synthesizing and putting back together words from, from the alphabet, the, these words or these sentences already exist and the availability is super high, so they have enough for your entire life. And whenever you experience something, then the most probable thing in any situation is already there uh, for you to be matched. So in other words, neurons that were born on the same day or close to each other, they are the ones that they wire together and therefore they fire together. So I think I made big claims. I, I'm sure I, I managed to upset many of you. So I am ready to try to answer many of your very smart questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you so much. Um... This has been pretty great. I just want to say before we start that how much I enjoyed in this book, uh, your very consistent and reliable return to questioning uh, kind of a Western philosophy of science. If you cr if you click that cross uh, the the X mark uh, in the middle of your screen, then if you go up up up, oh, yep. Okay. If you click Perfect. that one, no, it's much nicer. Perfect. Awesome. So I just want to say that in your book, uh, one thing I appreciated was something that you did also in your talk, which was um, not taking a Eurocentric view of the philosophy of science that you're trying to work on. And I think that there is some key um, insights in there. And I just want to make sure that uh, one of the things that we would do, not instead of like uh, uh, not the not in the direction of tearing apart, actually in the other direction is to think about a constructive way to dissociate this particular way that you're talking about from this idea that we don't learn anything. Because I feel like there is a war, there is a potential danger 
that everything is already pre-wired. We don't learn anything in the life. If somebody might go have a caricature version of the idea that everything is pre-configured, and that is obviously not what you're saying at all. Um, and so I just want to make sure that we really highlight the um, amazing things and like you know get 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 away from any potential kind of um, straw man that might be conf conflated with some of the sentences that you say. And throughout this, I will try to do that. Uh, with that, I just want to give it to John for the first round of questions. And I invite everyone in the chat, please remember to vote on each other's question and ask your questions in the ask a question area. And mention, if you <coughs> say, <laughs> John, say, ask for me if you want to be, um, if you don't want to be on screen, otherwise we might ask you to join on screen. Uh, John, take it away. Hi, Yuri. Um, like Ida, you know, I actually read your book. Um, I enjoyed your book. I actually read it last year, one and a half times. Um, and, you know, I think uh, what it's really wonderful to have the opportunity to talk to you again, I know we're meeting again at Hopkins sometime later this year, is I really want to try and unpack the various points you have and make and how they relate to each other, because you have a lot of very deep things to say, but I don't exactly know how they map onto each other. Okay, so in other words, there's the question of um, innateness versus learning, right? The nativist argument versus the learning argument. I was just happening to listen to a podcast that Jan LeCun gave recently, where he really was quite extreme and thought that the brain was a tabula rasa that learns. And I know that he's a colleague of yours at NYU, so I'm sure I imagine that you've had some debates with him about your, you know, the opposite, I think is fair to say, which is that you've got these pre-configured dynamics and connectivity, and then essentially they start to get selected and mapped onto events in the world, and they acquire their function and their meaning at the moment that they map onto an action or a behavior. Um, so the first issue is this very interesting pure learning versus pre-configured point of view. Then there's your, I think, quite legitimate critique of sort of where the Hubel and Weasel approach to neuroscience took us, right? And your point that in order to see that correlation between the sensory cortex and the stimulus, you need a third party observer to make the link between them, when in fact the brain from the inside doesn't have that, right? In other words, it has to discover it through an action. It's not looking in on itself and going, ah, coding, here's the stimulus, here's the neural response, because all the brain has is the neural response, right? Um, so you very much make that point as well. Um, so, there's the nativist versus the pure learning um, position. There's the um, one that we've just discussed in terms of the sort of Hubel and Weasel sort of coding fallacy, um, which without action, you can't actually get that relationship that is seen by a third party observer. Um, you then also have this critique um, of using psychological terms uh, and trying to find the neural correlates of the psychological, philosophical constructs, right? So you have a big view on that. Um, now, I have a lot of sympathy for all those positions. I absolutely agree with you that I'm very much a nativist. I very much believe that a lot of it is pre-wired and there before. Um, I also believe that it's, a, you know, finding tuning for stimuli approach to neuroscience is not that helpful uh, when, it, when you get beyond the central sulcus into motor and beyond. And I also kind of understand why we have to be careful to go looking for areas and neurons that correspond directly to quite vague, quite nebulous psychological terms. Um, so I find myself sympathetic to all those things. But the thing is, is when I combine them together, I don't come to the same conclusions of you 
which it seems to be in the end a sort of sensory motor action view of higher cognition. And it's ironic because I'm a motor person. I love the motor system, right? Um, and yet, I just don't see how we're going to get to explain the conversation the three of us are now having from this rather sensory motor action mapping of pre-configured circuits onto movement. It, it doesn't get me all the way. And I haven't seen, even in your book, how you get all the way. So, and in the meantime, we're going to have to use these psychological terms, at least for the behavior, and then model the behavior with better granularity, and then begin to think about what's happening in the brain. But it's a bit of a simplistic view that we're just vaguely using terms to map and mathematicalize behavior, I mean, surely the granularity will get better and better so that we have a better chance of mapping those behaviors with those terms and constructs onto the brain. So I, I guess my big question, and that was a long you know, intro, is I don't see how all the points you make individually lead to an alternative to cognitive neuroscience. Whoa. Okay. Well, thanks, John. I start with, with Ida saying that, yeah, thank you for the correction. Of course, I believe in learning. Which, what kind of a neuroscientist is not believing in, in learning? The question is, what are the brain mechanisms of this learning? And this is where our thinking is, is, has changed a little bit. You know, many of the audience, the young people, may have heard about this term LTP, <laughs> an Asian term that... <laughs> Nobody remembers anymore <laughs> because that was a big wave. And then we thought everything that is plasticity is learning. And the most plastic structure in the brain was the hippocampus, of course. And uh, this is how we build up. And there is what is what is it? What are the key words, the buzzwords in neuroscience? Heavy and plasticity, back propagation learning, <laughs> decision making, and all these things that are imbibing our head. Now, the interesting thing about words, and I see in the chat room a couple of questions related to that, is that different cultures use the different words and the, their concatenations very differently. If you are a Hindu, or if you are Persian, or if you are Jewish, I know, <laughs> then the, you learn the alphabet. You already and, the, and you learn the structure of, of of the pictures in front of you, in a totally different way. You know, for me, the future is in front. For the Chinese, the future is up. For some cultures, the, the future is back. And they all have an extraordinary, beautiful explanation for all of this. So, one general issue is that which one is good? And the answer is. I don't know, but I think that the current thing is that everybody who does neuroscience have to become a European and a European thinker is probably not the perfect idea. And the reason why I say European is because the language of science is based, especially neuroscience is based on British empiricism and the way how it does cause and effect relationships and so on. So is that the only way how we can think about it? And then this is when you say, oh, how did we make these terms and there is something very interesting relating to one of the points i showed you about how what is the relationship between episodic memories and semantic memories and i said every animal every animal has an own experience and if those experiences intersect then many of the non-relevant spatial temporal conditions are stripped off and the essential parts remain the same. So I can give you an example about, you know, my, my first souffle. The first souffle is an episode. The second and third and so on, those are just stripped off. And then the term souffle, the name, the semantic knowledge is left. Many neuroscientists agree that this is the way how semantic information is made. And I can do it 
and studied in the rodent. But something funny happened with humans. The funny thing that happened with humans is that we can acquire semantic knowledge by a shortcut, and it's called language. You tell something to me as an authority, and I don't question it. I don't have an experience. I, I don't know with, with USB. I don't have to know what USB thinks for. I just know that there is a name and there is a matching utility for it. And I learned it. Now, of course, this goes on and on and on. They can say, this is the script. This is uh, decision making. This is God and so on. And if it's said enough times by the authority, we believe it or we never question what is the mechanism behind or whether that statement is, has anything to do with my own experience. So this, this is what I wanted to respond to Ida. Now, moving to John, with, uh, going to the last question, I start out with some practical experience. In my younger days, a few years ago, <laughs> uh, I was a neuroethologist. You may remember what it means. You know, in my younger days, <laughs> the, the Nobel Prize was given for from Frisch, Tim Bergen, and Conrad Lawrence. And as a young person living in behind the Iron Curtain, imbibed in a philosophy or framework with Pavlovian association where behavior is irrelevant. All you have to do is eat when the, 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 the US is given to you. This was a antidote. So I became a neuroethologist and I did a lot of ethograms and, and you know how the, the, the cat pricks the ear and uh, how many times it defecates also and so on. The big question back then was whether the CS is a representation of the US. That is, it's a substitute of the US. As opposed to believing that, oh, something happened in this contingency of the CS and US, which becomes important for the animal. Therefore, the CS is worth investigating, which is an action-based epistemological act. Now, there were many, many, many fantastic people in the field. And one of them is called auto shaping. It's a super interesting large territory, and I belong to those guys. And so the question was whether the animal is treating the CS as a food or consumatory object, or it's an epi epistemological uh, target i don't know if you see the difference but it's a it's a huge difference so many experiments were done in one lab another lab one lab another lab. each of them were perfectly defending the way how the experiments were designed and there was no ending no amount of experimentation from behavior would give you the truth on the left or right now it happened that my mentor and Dragrosian was the very first person who recorded from the hippocampus in a freely moving animal and found that whenever the animal is exploring the environment, learning about something, there is state oscillation. So I thought, very simple. Let's put an electrode in the hippocampus. Let's present the animal with the CSUS contingencies and see what happens when the animal turns to the CS. And in a half an hour experiment, the answer was there that it is a explorative behavior not a conservative behavior, and no amount of exercise and planning in, in, in the ex behavioral experiments would give you the answer. So with that, I turn my thinking subconsciously. I say, I, let's start with the brain rather than from the outside, because the, the brain is the one that generates behavior. And just to, to conclude this part, this, ter this territory, very interesting territory, ethology or behavioral ethology or neuroethology, is dead. That, you know, I was the last, well, one of the last card carrying neuroethologists with Mark Konishi and uh, Walter Heilingerberg, but the field died. And the reason why the field died is because the only ground truth you, that you can, you can get is through the brain. And that's my point that it's true also for many of the psychological terms. There is nothing wrong with, with using words, of course. There, without words, we can't communicate. When I talked about a little bit about the, 
the, the time and space. I cannot explain anything without resorting to these crutches of human thinking, which is time and space. Yes, we have to continue on our conversation and we use words that were, are useful today, maybe useful tomorrow, but with the understanding that these are words that are there for temporarily explain those things that we may not, we, we don't understand currently, but with time we may. And, and you said, oh, how do we move forward? And I said, well, my, and my good example, not my good example, but what I think is a good example is the merging of the navigation and memory field in a relatively reasonable manner through the brain, through the, the functions of the hippocampus. And if we don't have that, though, especially if you don't have, you know, human participant, just, just imagine that we never had a lesion brain or any neuroscience on that, then people would be still fighting whether the hippocampus is a navigation device or it is a memory device. So I don't think our views differ. All I'm saying is that it's wonderful that we came to where we are, but maybe we are in a little bit of a dead end street somewhere, and maybe it's a little faster progress if you try something else. So again, Ida is very kind to me that you said, you have to spell out that it's not that I, I'm advocating Wittgenstein's philosophy saying that you know, all words are bad, uh, although I share many of his skepticism, or I say that, that we shouldn't use the term memory, but we have to think about those things. Maybe in time, there will be a better way of thinking whether attention and speed, which are so different from each other, actually are served by the same neurophysiological mechanism, such as... Sure, I, but, but this, the thing is, is, you know, I just, I don't disagree with the brain being an arbiter of competing ideas that come from behavior. But let's give the example you gave. Is it consumer? Is it a consumer representation or is it exploratory? You conceived of an either or hy hy hypothesis based on behavior and words, and then you broke the tie by going into the brain. If you hadn't had those concepts, which you then went to the brain to help resolve, you certainly wouldn't have come up with those concepts if you just got into the brain without them to begin with. So in, other words, so in other words, it's incredibly misleading, I think, even though you don't intend it, that you make it sound as though if you went into the brain first, no, you would no. suddenly have a flowering of let's, different let's concepts. This. Let's clarify right? this. I didn't, right. to, I didn't say that. I didn't want to say that. If I said it, I said it. Just right, but I think, so, and I think if, if you say, look, we can ever refine, make finer grained, throw some words out that become useless the way the ether became useless, that through a, through a process of iteration of conceptualization and modeling, behavioral experiments and neural breaking of the tie, and that process sending out all your hounds equally on a level playing field of evidence can help refine and hone the words you use, well, then no one's disagreeing, right? Okay. So, so but, 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 but it sounds sometimes like if you just bypassed observation and behavior and modeling and just said, let's go into the brain sooner than later, that that itself would yield words that were qualitatively different in and of itself from the process by which we conceive and then go into the brain. But I think the people who take the strong version of you think that there's an alternative route versus what I think makes more sense, which is just add brain data to your evidence base. Okay. Now, who is going to disagree with that? So those people who think that we just go to the laboratory without thinking that stick electrodes in the brain and some magic will pop out, that's crazy, obviously. But it's also not perfectly right what you are just saying that okay let's just look at the 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 chart that were given to us by the william james or the other people and find out the territories and see how they relate to each other because what is the probability that our predecessors actually thought about things that 
are there but we never thought of. So, for example, can we just discover things from the brain workings that you never thought about? Let me give you an example. You know, this is a, a, a debate we had with the, with the David Popper. Is that we discovered that there are many rhythms in the brain, and they relate to each other. And it happens that the way how we speak has the same tempo, and the way how we perceive sound has exactly the same tempo how those brain oscillations work. And there is a good branch of linguistics now that buy into the idea, and, and, and there are many experiments showing that how you do the lip reading or how you do comprehension and how you do this and that with the help of a internal organizer. It's, it's a little you know, simplified Chomsky and kind of thing that there is already a given framework that allows you to speak and to allows you to perceive the statistical features of, of language or, 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 or verbal language is the same in every culture. Yet everybody who listens to a stutterer in a language that you don't understand, you can still recognize a stutterer because it is breaking the tempo. And that person, if I can record from that brain, I can identify it right away from the brain oscillation. Now, the, the message here is that we studied this cross-frequency phase coupling and complicated things that we never ever thought about language. Never. I was working in rodents, not in humans, but all of a sudden it gives rise to a extraordinary explanation to people who never thought about that the brain has something like this, which is useful. Same so, thing so with psychiatry, that every single psychiatric disease can be, or almost everyone, can be associated with one or other type of impairment of this constellation of brain rhythms. Now, you talked about this, uh, let's just make peace and uh, you know, negotiate back and forth. If you read DSM-5, it is full with funny names. And every psychiatrist knows that this is just name. It cannot be right. And I cannot treat my patients according to these boxes. Is there a practical implications of what I'm saying? Yes, there is. It's not just negotiation and go into the brain, but say, go into the brain, find a strategy such as I say, here's the constellation of, of brain rhythms. I can guarantee you that if you find a drug that affects this pattern in the rodent, that it will affect my brain in the, in the human brain pretty much the same way. And that could be a useful drug for particular things. And it can affect probably a multiple different types of categories in psychiatry without putting people into different boxes. Okay, okay so Yuri, just to, to talk to you about that, okay? Again, it's just, I just believe that there's a more nuanced way. I mean, you're talking about brain rhythms and basically doing some sort of taxonomy of mental disease based on something more grounded, which is rhythms. You know, this is exactly what the neurotransmitter people said when psychopharmacology came along, right? Instead of rhythms, just talk about neurotransmitters. And it's been a failure, okay? Now, it may well be that the components of rhythms are a better substrate for drug discovery than neurotransmitters, right? But this gets to my sort of other point that you always use, in, and the control theorists do the same, when it comes to meaning, that meaning is what happens when you have a pre-configured pattern, it maps onto an action, it leads to a correct prediction, and voila, there's meaning, okay? But one of the things about psychiatric disease is that it's meaning-based disease. So let me give you an example that others have given, and I wish I could remember, but I always like this example. Let's take obsessive-compulsive disease, okay? And let's take obsessive hand-washing, okay? When people obsessively hand wash and they're asked why they're doing it, they say it's because they're terrified of germs. Now that's really interesting because then what would they have said before the germ theory of disease came along, right? So you see a very interesting interaction between a meaning-based notion which only came into existence in the 19th century, so you could, so, and the notion of obsessive hand washing. So when people get talk therapy and they're told meaning-based words about what they're doing, 
what you're kind of implying is all that meaning-laden way of thinking about your life and what's going on can be jettisoned entirely, and we could just have a little ratio of different brain rhythms and just quantify them and target them. So it, it just seems to me that what this is attesting to is we don't really know what happens when we say to somebody, don't open, as Daniel Dennett has said, that can of that box there, it's full of poisonous steaks, and you come to a complete stop and you don't go near that box because you've just been told it's full of poisonous snake. So in other words, these kind of meaning-based, very causal effects, right? You, your body stops moving when you find out there are poisonous snakes in that box, or you obsessively wash your hands because you're afraid of germs. What I'm worried about is that your story, which I'm very sympathetic to, can't get us all the way. And the, and the final point is, is that I have no objection to going in to the brain for therapeutic reasons and maybe some neurotransmitter-based drugs and some physiological approaches on brain rhythms will have an effect. But that's still, even if that were to work and talk therapy was destroyed forever, it still doesn't tell us where the meaning of things like, oh, germs are bad for you and oh, that box is full of poison snakes. We still need to know where those kind of concepts come from or as Christoph Koch has said, understanding black holes, we can't touch black holes, we can't walk towards them, we can't move in any way towards them, but we can still conceive of them. So I just feel that there's a gap that when people are inactivist and body-based and inside-out based, gloss over. Okay, so I think there are good people and not so good people on both ends. Um, I don't want to defend the not so good people, but let's take OCD. So as you just said, oh, the way I explain OCD is that, oh, there are germs out there. I have to be careful. Therefore, I wash my hands millions of times. This is exactly the same outside in approach as uh, for anything else. That is, we believe that we sense something and then we have to make a decision. And that decision makes me move my hands and I go to the bathroom and so on. But I would think the other way around said, well, first of all, there is a brain problem. The brain problem starts, I, I wish I could explain you how it works in the OCD, but suppose that there is a little bit of, of shift of uh, the, the, the system. It's, a, it's like excitability increases, then there is a, a higher chance to have a seizure. If, if something happens a little bit on the other end, then you move more and then you move more and that, that urge to move is translated into some rational explanation. This is you act and then you acquire... I wasn't saying that fear of germs, but just to be clear, sorry to interrupt you, I wasn't saying that fear of germs is what causes obsessive hand washing. Okay, what I'm but, saying is, I was I not saying that at all. What I was saying is, isn't it interesting that in addition to whatever the originating disease process is, and I agree with you, it's some contingent effect which then maps on, but I'm just saying that this confabulation, this meaning generation thing that we do, right, me, is, is something that we have to explain also. Yeah. Sorry, just just uh, for timekeeping and, and housekeeping purposes. Uh, so please go ahead and answer John's questions. Then I'll ask my question and then I'll bring three people three by three to the screen <coughs> because the sure, limit is sure, absolutely. Thanks, Ida. So John, no, 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 of course, okay, absolutely. We're getting I just answer that and you're absolutely right. Too. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Well, it's so an go interesting. Ahead. I don't know what you said. It's a box of snakes that we raised up because OCD is actually also a cognitive issue. So pe there are people who Leslie Stoll, you know, in 60 minutes explored. And these are people with big memories. And people who have big memories are as it's as devastating as washing your hands because they have the compulsion to organize. This is why they remember everything, because they put stuff in their memories compulsively. And the many memory people said, oh, what is so funny about the brain? What is so extraordinary? They must have a huge hippocampus. It turns out, no, the hippocampus is just normal. The striatum, the striatum is large with people with big memory. And this is not a big memory. This is a big semantic store, which is a compulsion to organize or do things. And maybe, and maybe, I'm, I hope I will be right, that 
this is the same as the regular motor OCD. It just happens at a different level. And the underlying neurological mechanism is probably very similar. But without going into the brain, without trying to clarify it, we just give them different names. So I already see you that you said, OK, you give me the credit not me, I mean, neuroscientists, that going into the brain is more than just talking. What I'm adding to it, maybe just looking at the brain as it is also help you to clarify the relationship among those terms that we made up, but also may provide you different insights that the current vocabulary does not allow. Thank you so much for your patience, John. Obviously, you can jump in later after a couple of other of us ask a question. Well, we invite you to our next debate with John at the at University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, so, okay. So I have a couple of things to say. I think that there was an interesting... So I might be a very late comer to the cognitive neuroscience field. But some of the things that you were criticizing, I feel like they were already gone when I entered the field. So, may, so let me let, let me just get my head around this. And I studied philosophy of mind and philosophy of science before I came into, so first computer, computer science, then I did philosophy of science, philosophy of mind, and then I did cognitive neuroscience. So my background is very computational and philosophical before I arrived. And by the time I arrived, um, and I work on episodic memory, perspective memory, predictive representations, successor representations. And other than episodic memory, I build models of the very internal navigation you're talking about. And I absolutely love it. That's how we, we use it in our papers too. I think of it as internal navigation on any sequence. It doesn't need to be spatial. Space is not special. Uh, it could be social sequences. It could be any sequences that we put around. So I really appreciate it that you highlighted that in, in your book and in what you're saying. Um, if I understood it correctly. Uh, something that you said really uh, kind of chimed with me because it's the principle of some of the models that I built since the 90s, in fact. So it's even, you know, when I was uh, very young and I was not even, you know, an adult. Um, so uh, something that you said that I really appreciated was that navigation is in both physical and mental space is a succession of events which is exactly the way um, our models kind of model it. They don't know if it's time or space or social interactions. It's just a succession of events. And hippocampus is a general purpose sequence generator that encodes content limited ordinal structure and tiles the gaps between events uh, or things to be linked. So I really appreciated that you had this on your slides and it fits very beautifully with the kinds of models that we build that have also ex existed since the 90s, since the early 90s. Um, on the other hand, there is since 2004, we have Alva Noah's series of work, which is action in perception, uh, which I'm sure you're aware of. And he argues uh, about these internal actions also as well, even in perception. He says even perception is um, action in perception. On the other hand, the entire 90s, we had the debate between anti-representationalists and representationalists, which I feel like in the early 2000s, the idea was a revised notion of in, uh, representationalism. So anti-representationalism is not anymore something that anybody that I know really holds. Um, but there was definitely a more cautious uh, understanding and a more clear definition of representations. Another thing was the people who were working on dynamics. So it became representation and dynamics. So there was dynamical systems and you could have state spaces. And so the notion of representation was no longer kind of isomorphic. It was really in this kind of dynamic state spaces. Um, then I'm thinking about uh, the fact that in spite of the fact that we can take caution in our use of representations and we can talk about the fact that there could be internal wiring like at birth about what cells can wire together, still due to learning, different, there's a lot of candidate cells that could be wiring, that could be firing together. Not all of them fire together all at the same time. There is a particular way that we learn over time at which time, which cells that can fire together will and at which time they won't. So that selective firing together is still the basis. So although we talk about cells that fire together, wire together, there is still a strengthening of association between cells that can fire together, that start to fire together because I'm forming a new habit, let's say. 
And this could be that I learned to speak Hungarian, which is one of the most difficult grammars on the earth. And then after that, maybe particular parts of my brain will start to work that they didn't before, because this is a lot of grammar to parse at the same time. Uh, it's not that I wasn't born with the ability for them to fire together, but they hadn't learned this particular structure of firing together. So with all of that said, one thing I want to say is maybe because I joined neuroscience and I'm much younger than you in terms of coming to neuroscience, uh, not in age, but in terms of just joining cognitive neuroscience, I feel like uh, maybe a lot of the things that uh, you were discussing, I feel like you're totally right. And this is how I learned things in, neuros in cognitive neuroscience. Um, and so I, I don't find them particularly, let's say, um, counter to at least the traditions that I grew up in. And second, um, going back to the fire together, wire together, while I understand your argument is that not anything can fire together and wire together in the brain, and I think that's great. But when we accept that, there is still, <laughs> there is still in um, uh, among the cells that are candidates for being able to fire together, there is something that in the brain that needs to learn, that needs to manage, that needs to react to the external world. There is something outside in that tells me when is the right time for these cells or those cells to fire together. So if I'm driving, I definitely want to have in, outside in signals telling my cells not to fire together or to fire together selectively. So maybe we, uh, I was wondering if you could say something about those things. So first, um, uh, about whether you do think that some of the things that you say in some fields, at least of cognitive neuroscience since 2007, when I entered the field uh, as a grad student, whether the, some of these might be uncontroversial, uh, but other ones maybe um, if we edit them and if we are careful about how to phrase them, we still need to account for the fact that candidate cells that could fire together, when they do fire a lot, their connection gets stronger than others. So still the term, the, the phrase fire together, wire together could make sense with the, with, the sub, with the kind of footnote, with the limitation that they have to be able to fire together to begin with, and that requires some internal um, uh, connection. So please go ahead. Okay, so Joan basically said that what I'm saying is useless and and what you are saying is obsolete. <laughs> and, and, and so I, I, maybe I'm just uh, behind the times. Oh, no, I'm not saying it's obsolete. I, I'm I agree saying... that I have never met a neuroscientist who would say, oh, I believe in tabula rasa. Nobody would say that. But if you are reading the papers, you will see that the experimental designs are still according to this framework. And when you read the discussions, without, I wouldn't say without exceptions, you know, but by and large, they are within the same tabula rasa framework. Now, Alva Noah and the others, yeah, they were thinkers before, and we can go back to plateau all the way, right, from the inside out, as you say, there's nothing new under the sun. Well, maybe things are going up and down and so on, and there was representational debates back then. Now it's uh, too much, perhaps, and maybe it is, uh, you know, maybe I, I should take, or somebody should take the role of uh, saying that, wait a second, you have to stop a little bit. Now, when you started doing your, your algorithms, you said, well, I'm modern, I'm a contemporary person because I learned philosophy. Maybe but maybe because there is no other way. You couldn't put in time or space in your algorithm because you don't know how. It's impossible. The brain doesn't know it either. So that's the interesting part that when, when people, computational scientists who live from the output, you know, you have to produce an output. This is why I like the, the brain machine interface as an interesting part of neuroscience because there is not much choice there. You have to make that damn cursor move so, you know, the, 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 the answer is al already there and maybe in computational neuroscience. What I said about computational neuroscience that they bought into this by and large, and there are extraordinarily nice people who think and, and, and interestingly write to me that say, oh, well, I, I, I think we are doing it the way how you advocate that. Why, why don't we make an algorithm or a, a AI system where we have all the components there. It's, it's a big Lego system 
that we don't have to build up from scratch because it collapses. We know it collapses most of the time and people try to find ways such as the sleep-wake algorithm and other things to prevent catastrophic interference. But if you build a system that is goal is to maintain its dynamic and no perturbation from the outside world will affect it, that would be progress. Are we there? No. Do I see something like this in AI? I do see a little bit, but by and large, you know, my typical slide when I talk about this is a sentence from Alan Turing who says the brain is like the stationery that you buy in the store. It's a, it's, a, it's a white paper. Now, when you say, do I throw out plasticity? Of course I don't throw out plasticity. But when you say there's a Lego system and the Lego is chunks of things rather than individual things, maybe it's better and you can have one trajectory, as you said, another trajectory, and you can jump from one to other with the help of inhibition. Inhibition can do miracles. Many of us, you know, this is how my world started to converge with cognitive scientists when we worked on in inhibitory neurons and, the, and the, the, the functions they produce. All of a sudden you go from one to the other so you can concatenate same things in a very different and flexible way. Is it plasticity? Yeah, it's some kind of a plasticity. Is it NMDA dependent plasticity? No, it's not at all. And so this is the kind of thing that I think is a, if you want reiteration of the brain in the body problem, but it's also a different kind of thinking when I said, when I say it's no, 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 not only that any neuron can have a list of plasticity. What I'm saying is that there must be a rule, not mass, but it seems to be a rule, which is a skewed distribution. So there are neurons that are firing faster, larger, have more connectivity. They are friendly with other neurons of the same type. They get information in a high priority from each other and from everybody else. And they are part of the decisions of the brain more often than all the other, the, the great majority. So this is a different type of thinking. Don't tell me that, that you know, this was there in Alva Noe, because <laughs> he didn't know about this, but this skewed view of the brain can bring us back to the old Weber Fechner law. Tell me one, or maybe John can help out, but tell me one neurophysiological explanation of the Weber law. There is none, not really. Whereas if you look at it in a different way, they said, well, we can make decisions all the time and those decisions are there for you because the minority of the brain is ready to do good enough decisions. So do you mind if we ask a couple of um, clarifications, oh. which I think uh, oh, uh, similarly, um, David Tamaris asked it also. Uh, they asked, so inhibition helps manage lots of little repertoires saying, put me in coach, and plasticity boosts their prevalence. And that's how he understands. And the way I would like to also clarify is, are you, you're saying that, so is it constantly inhibition to choose one versus the other, or is it the case that the threshold for even firing might reduce if you inhibit it a lot? And some other ones that are less inhibited, their threshold for firing, sorry, the threshold for firing for the ones that are inhibited a lot would increase. And the threshold for firing of the ones that are uh, uh, less inhibited might decrease. So I wonder, and in that way, there is not a need constantly for a constant inhibition of everything all the time. Um, functions that become more common in the uh, agent uh, become less, um, become more easy basically to fire at the same time. Like, I wonder whether you think this makes sense. Because I, I, I was worried a little bit that you're saying that uh, the connection between two things can't go high. So uh, the view that there is a network dynamic in the cells in the brain and there is a connectivity and there is a graph theory to what is the role, what is the centrality, particular type of betweenness or eigenvector centrality of a cell. And depending on that, it's going to have a different dynamic with the others. That's perfect in network neuroscience. Like we definitely think like that. That's that's how we model it. That's beautiful. We even model memory networks like that, that they kind of have a connection with each other. Even the, the kind of, uh, you know, 
word embeddings are like that. It's just frequency of how often certain words appear together. And if you map it to graph theory, you can see some of them are more central and some of them are more marginal. That's totally fine. But the question is, do you think that the connection between two neurons can, in, like the association between them or between two memories, so two populations of neurons, can increase or decrease? Because, uh, or so I think that's the that's the thing that is a little confusing. If you say it's inhibition, it almost sounds like you're saying it doesn't ever decrease. There's just always something that is de inhibiting it. But that's not what you only think. You also think it's possible for connection between things to increase or decrease, right? So. We were discussing large chunks of neuroscience or cognitive science, and all of a sudden we are down to the very small details. And I don't pretend, I don't even want to pretend that with inhibition I can address those problems. But since you asked about <laughs> inhibition, you say, well, here there are various ways how people's frameworks help move forward. I would say the dominant framework, at least where there are models to explain things, are all about what's called blanket inhibition. That is, inhibition is there like a feedback. And then when it increases, it's like a gain on your radio. And everybody is proportionally affected. It doesn't seem to be the case at all. So inhibition is very distributed. They are extraordinarily complicated. So, so it's not about whether they go up or down. So for example, what would happen, well, what happens, and this is an experiment we published recently, is that when you silence all pyramidal cells in the hippocampus, pharmacogenetically, by exciting the interneurons, every type of interneurons, so then you can make a prediction. You are a computational neuroscientist that, well, all inhibitory neurons are excited. The consequence of this would be that pyramidal cells are decreased. And that's what happens, but with a funny twist that inhibitory interneurons are also decreasing their firing rates, even though every one of them is excited. But they are also interconnected. And one of them affects the other and so on. So there are many, many of these examples where in a complex system it's hard to say that inhibition does everything excitation does everything in this particular uh, uh, frame of, of problems that you rose that i said our contribution would be to show for example this is the last paper that i, I showed that play cells are not because they are excited from the outside it's because we took away some inhibition and we can do it artificially and show that this is how certain neurons are expressing. This is how we allow them to fire. We are not, we don't necessarily have to drive. And there is a big difference between thinking whether something is allowed or something is forced. So these are the neuroscientific, whatever it is, at the network level problems. And of course, it would be wonderful to bring it back to John's level. I don't think we are there yet. We are trying, you are trying, many of us are trying, but the concepts for me remain pretty much the same. Can I understand various things, such as the sequential generation of the activity from the outside world? You know, grid cells are driving plate cells and so on. Or we had a paper in Neuron recently where we showed that the CA1 region, which doesn't even have strong recurrency, is capable of maintaining its dynamic enormously. The number of plate cells remain, the fraction of plate cells in CA1 remains the same after inactivating the entorhinal cortex and the CA3, the major inputs. So these are the kind of things that I find over and over, and which is, is at least in our lab, we try to connect from the smaller level to the mid-level and from the mid-level to the higher level. Great, I just, to your question, Alfonso Reinhardt um, had a paper, I believe in Nature Neuroscience, I'll find it. Um, back in 2019, where they actually tried to come up with a computational model of Weber's law, um, and based on some really nice experiments in rats or mice, I believe, when they were trying to discriminate between sounds represented laterally. And they actually made some very nice predictions as to what you would expect to find neurally if that computational model that underlies Weber's law was correct. 
And, and that, that paper to me very much represents what I was trying to say before, which is you think deeply about it, you start to come up with a nice experiment, which they did, and then you come up with a computational model that has predictions, if it's correct, with respect to what we should expect by neurally. Right. So in other words, that seems to be the dance. So I'm not saying what you're saying is useless. I'm just saying that I just am not completely convinced that qualitatively different concepts are that common strictly from brain data without it being this dance between modeling behavior and neural confirmation. And, uh, and, it's, and it's not useless And I, what you're saying. I'm just saying that the strong version of your point of view is often, I think, exaggerated um, and not always attributable to you yourself. Um, and I'll put that in the Okay, uh, so let's chat. start with, with what you just said. Yes, of course, uh, ever since Weber, people are trying to figure out that there are receptor mechanisms, there are many other mechanisms, there are beautiful computational models out there, but you do it for one particular psychophysics, let's say hearing, and then you have a model. And my question is, can you take the exact same model and to explain uh, the Weber law in vision? Maybe you can a little bit. Can you explain the Weber, Weber law in space perception? That's already a little complicated. Can you tell me why our view of time is skewed, just like it's Weber time? Can you tell me why memories are organized according to a skewed Weber law? That is, when an animal makes a decision or has evidence in, in your parlance, or in computational parlance after being rewarded, they said, oh, I'm going to the, this direction. The best prediction from the neurons is at the beginning, very strong, and then it comes down just like a wave below. So this is the this is a kind of things that I question, not question, I just put as a problem to myself is that if there is a wave below of the brain, is it that every system in evolution had to figure out individually what is the solution to that? Or there is a fundamental mechanism that is there in every single structure or dynamic, such as the hippocampus, such as the striatum, even the cerebellum, and everywhere. And those mini models, sorry to, I'm, I'm, I'm not, these are wonderful models, but <laughs> those specific models are not thinking about generalizability enough. I see familiar nice faces here, Melanie, John, mm -hmm. and uh, also a nice philosopher here, Luis. I think John's question was the higher voted, and you had a couple of questions, John, so why don't you- well, start? I'll start with, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'll start with the question that Ida prompted me to, to ask, and it was actually a challenge, something she said. She said that sp place was not special, these general algorithms used across all sorts of associated things. And I'd like to argue that place is or was special in evolution, that the first problem was navigation, and that other um, algorithms hopped on that train and used space as a metaphor for solving them. I don't know what you think, Yuri. Uh, yes, it's a very strong view. Uh, if you read the, the latest uh, review in the Journal of Physiology by uh, John, uh, John O'Keefe and, and Krupitz, they are beautifully putting everything in this framework. And exactly, you know, it resonates with you, I know, that everything out there is the world and that's a three-dimensional world and that's a cartesian space and this is exactly what is imbibed by the brain or emulated by the brain and the arguments are evolutionary pretty convincing in one sense that we are absorbing what's outside there maybe I, i'd like to not go as strong as they do but say uh, one brain the evolution of brains and locomotion seem to go together and the first challenge is, to, is efficient locomotion. But then exactly. pretty quickly, exactly. it could have been overrided. By, by and, other and this, is, this, is, this is completely missing from the cognitive map, as you probably agree, that you know, the movement, the navigation is not there. But let's us think about uh, in a slightly different way. What if brains were evolved not to perceive the world, but to serve the body? And then in any niche, any niche, any environment, whether you are on a two-dimensional environment on the sea floor. And there is no vestibular system for you to vertical perception because it's not there. Then your, your brain 
builds up the world according to your brain activity and everything. And it just happens, perhaps, that you can map the outside world and where you navigate according to your existing brain dynamic and make up explanations such as Euclidean space and so on. So I don't think it's totally different what you are saying, what John O'Keefe says. The question is whether a brains were built for that purpose or that brains were built for a different person's purpose and were repurposed for dealing with the outside world. You'd also and like to um, bring in head direction cells, which are, I think, more convincingly spatial than place cells. Yes. And you certainly so, know a lot about that. And it's also the head direction so, so cells. Let's, let's, let's just freeze here for a, for a second. So we dedicated, to those of you who don't know, quite a bit of time, not because we were interested in place or the head direction cells, but I always wonder if something is there to respond to something in the world. What do those cells that are supposed to respond to the world do during sleep? And what we found, as you remember, that even during REM sleep and non-REM sleep, these head direction cells are active just like in the real world. So they are internally, they are generating an attractor independent of the, how it was. So you can say, oh, the brain has no choice. It emulated the world and therefore the head direction system was built up from elementary plasticity and so on. And then it just cannot help. It will continue doing it during sleep as well. But my thinking is the other way around. I wonder what those places, have you ever thought about the head direction system, how they might work and fire during memory? Because they are part of the same system, right? The navigation system. So I'm curious to see the experiment. And then we can restart the discussion again. And finally, about head direction cells, it seems like they're a better candidate for merging the outside world, the, in, the outside from the inside analysis. They're, they're closer to a mechanistic explanation for the external phenomenon. Uh, yes and no. So, you know, if you look at the moth, the moth is not exactly head direction, but it looks at some direction, the like polarization of the, the light. And then you can put your hand there five million times and the animal responds. But they're bigger brains, such as the mouse brain and my brain. I can close my eyes and my head direction cells still continue firing. And so it, it shows that it's not driven by the external world. Your, your argument was that it maybe have driven throughout evolution, and this is how it was built up. But that argument I can put upside down and say, no, there was a mechanism in the brain that was utilized for that. I don't so know if any of you see the difference, but here's an example. Ida, you, you, you are the moderator. Let me cut. Cut me off, please. I, I just wanted to say that um, I think I don't have a, I definitely don't have an issue with the idea that even the internal mechanism of the brain that allows for sequence processing evolved initially because we had uh, some, some much earlier creature needed to navigate. And I wish Paul Chizik was here. He was here earlier, but he had to leave early. Um, so at some point when we had like, you know, a very tiny organism that would, that just had to move around and had no brain, obviously the, the issue was navigation and food. And at some point the brain evolves. And I agree with uh, the point that John, uh, uh, is making, which is much weaker than the point of, uh, the other John, not this, jo okay. This Big John. John O'Keefe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's much weaker than the O'Keefe claim. I think John, uh, is saying, um, uh this sequence processing circuit you're talking about that you're saying it's it's a chicken and egg discussion he's saying this uh circuit uh, that allows for sequence processing initially evolved because we had to navigate then it got reappropriated with everything um for other domains because now it's a general purpose sequence processing but um at the same time uh i think the question is where do we draw that moment where it moved from being navigation related to just being a general purpose sequence processing. I think O'Keefe thinks it, we're still in that stage. Uh, like we are still in the stage where it's mainly uh, uh, or maybe solely place. Uh, I think maybe John Kuby is already a lot further uh, and says that at, in our species and in potentially rodents and like, you know, uh, many other species, it's not, it's sequence processing and it's not just space. 
uh, and space is only special because it used to be important in the development of this circuit. John, do I understand you correctly? Yeah, that's uh, totally, totally correct. Um, so the, just, the recurring yeah. theme here from John and John and you too, and maybe others, is that where do we cut the line? This is what you said. And I think this is exactly what drives science. Then you said, oh, I cut the line here. And I said, let's move the line a little bit this direction. And that's all I'm saying. <laughs> and the way I'm, I'm trying to do uh, make extreme things is because I learned something from other people that unless you make your opinion explicit and extreme, it's impossible to attack. And, and if, if you don't attack, you don't understand me, I don't understand you. So yes, indeed, they, we, do, do we cut the line well? No, in case of head direction cells, said, oh, it was the environment that drove this, or it was the head direction cells were evolved for something else first. How do we know without an experiment? Here is an example. Sharp wave ripples that I mentioned a couple of times. You know, several laboratories spent decades figuring out how useful it is for cognition. Now, there are smart people out there, such as Gilles Laurent, for example, who recorded sharp wave ripples in a lizard and says, wait a second, this guy doesn't have a real cortex. So who is reading that ripples? So that bothered me a lot. And recently we just published that these sharp wave ripples actually decrease the blood sugar level in the body. So these patterns, such as the sharp wave ripple, evolved to serve the body and was repurposed for something extraordinarily complicated, not because of the ripple itself, but because of the complexity and enormous growth of the neocortex. So the readers, the, 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 the information, whatever term you use for this thing, I'm not using it in the Shannonian manner, but information is not in the sender. Information is always in the reader. The same patterns can be, the same picture can be read by different ways, by different observers. And the more the observer, or more, the, the, the more of them are, the richer the information. And this is the case with evolution, that the re neocortex is this extraordinarily large reader base. That's why we are so smart, not because the hippocampus got smarter. Can I make a, another comment that a correlate is not just always equivalent to a correlate. There's strong correlates and weak correlates. In my reading, of looking at the rat literature's place is a real strong correlate. Head direction is an incredibly strong correlate. And other things, um, that's the candidate to match. And if you're going to say, well, we've reached a threshold and they're all the same, that I think that can be challenged. Yeah, so that are not only strong correlates, I would say convenient correlates. So you, you know our paper about the lateral septum. Just imagine what happened if John O'Keefe stumbled into the lateral septum before it went to the hippocampus 40 years ago. He would have made the same cognitive map theory on the lateral septum because there is a very good relationship between the phase of the spikes in the lateral septum relative to hippocampal theta oscillations and where the animal is. But today we wouldn't consider it because we know this large database. But something is strong, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the only thing. Thank you so much. Um, this was very enlightening and I appreciate that our views actually are a little closer than I thought. I think that I might be a little closer to um, uh, Gary here in terms of where we draw the line, but I agree that at some point the circuit should have developed for evolutionary reasons, by the way. Um, Melanie, uh, why don't you go next? And hopefully, Luis, you're not, you still have time, right? We're not, yeah, okay, perfect, go ahead. Great, thank you so much for this talk, it's fascinating. Um, I work in AI, and so I wanted to ask your some of your thoughts about the current state of AI. You know, you talk about how uh, the, the goal of the brain is to control the body and cognition is internalized action and so on, which, um, is, is somewhat a foreign idea in, in AI in that, you know, most AI systems don't have a body, don't have any model, internal models to do internalized action. So wh what would your thoughts be about how to make progress in AI towards more human-like intelligence, if that's a goal, or maybe that's impossible? 
Uh, I am not an authority in AI. I'm not a person to take seriously when it comes to AI because I know so little. I have conversations with people and I think the, my take is that in AI, two things are merging together without cutting, showing the line, as, <laughs> as Ida says, between robotics, which is a practical AI, and the, and, and the, the, the outside-in AI. And so as long as AI is there to solve problems, it's an extraordinary field. It's, I mean, there's no dispute about that. I mean, they, they, what they accomplished over the years is extraordinary. So I, I, when I was at, at UCSD, you know, Terry Sainovsky arrived and so on. We talked about tons and tons of discussions about PDP and so on. And I remember vividly when, when experts said, human vision is so special. You know, there is no way to build an AI system that will recognize faces. <laughs> and that was only 30 years ago. And it's all gone now. Is this make AI bad or, or good? It makes AI good as a practic practically, uh, uh, as, a, as an engineering tool. Does it help to understand the brain? This is the debate is. Now we have to talk to those people who they are thinking and uh, saying that we are using biology inspired ideas. What they do, sorry to some of them, I know many of them, they say what they do, but it's basically a lip service. So we do a wake sleep algorithm because you guys show that sharp wave ripples replay is useful and this is a way to solve certain problems. Uh, we do this with SLAM. SLAM is a you, an extraordinary success and that I like because there they had to solve the navigation and that was the first time in robotics where people subconsciously or perhaps consciously realized that no amount of work on sensory inputs make the robot better. You know, you can have 500 cameras and, and any type of sensors, it wouldn't make navigation better. But if you make it a output control device, such as it started out with the, with the uh, Gray Walter, for example, with, and with the, with the specula, Mahina Speculatrix, <laughs> if you remember that, that kind of lineage is missing to me. And so if you would, you know, my heart critic is that the brain inspiration based AI is inspired by the wrong brain model. And this is when I hope that uh, John will wake up and said, oh, what the crazy things I'm saying. But if you <laughs> believe in the inside out idea, that is that there is a pre-configured dynamic and it, it cannot be perturbed and build a AI system, it's not like reservoir computing or something like that, but an updated version of that. Maybe that will be a different outcome. But it Sorry. will be human kind of thing, and this sort of thing, I leave this to the philosophers. So how, how, do, we, how do we build that, pre, that predefined dynamic? Do we have to evolve it, or do we know enough to build it? Well, yeah, you, know, you, know, certain, you know certain things, how to start, so if a system is built by equal elements, I don't even look at it because it's not, I know it's not right. If it has a log normal distribution, that's already a progress. Uh, does it have side loops for certain things? It's, it's useful. Can it, be, can it tie back? Can it make a prediction? Can you build a system based on predictions and the predictions can be verified by measurements? And these are the kind of mini models that we are doing in, in, in our laboratory. <laughs> what is the name of the puppy? He's so cute. <laughs> okay, I believe with you. So, Luis. So cute. Um, just wanted to say, so uh, wouldn't the architecture of our of what we build oh, count as <laughs> so cute? Wouldn't the architecture of a particular AI agent count as that pre-configuration? 
it would be premature for me and I, as i said i'm a total dilettante but people are like Volga mass if you know the name and these people are thinking along these lines and uh, as, as i mentioned reservoir computing but there are similar solutions they seem to be all failures so far maybe they are not big enough but you know that's a, a, a wrong argument perhaps is because you can have a very intelligent brain from a thousand neurons for a small creature because it is still serving its own body and in its own niche so it's not necessarily the numbers but that system is built with a dynamic that is is there forever it's very difficult to perturb so i think the primary thing for an for a brain like ai would be to have a goal <laughs> one particular goal i you can do whatever you want and insulate everything to that goal and solve that with mechanisms that obey <laughs> what you know about brain connectivity and brain dynamic uh, and it may, it may not be the right thing you know if if i had to design the human brain maybe i would start with a one gigahertz clock maybe it would be more efficient but you know evolution didn't work that way so it, it it contains a lot of things that are inherited and tested and tested and tested and tested over and over again. Uh, we could go on forever, but let's uh, move on to Luis and then we will bring other people slowly and um, hopefully everybody please stay on screen and continue uh, for this round until we start the next round. Please go ahead, Luis. Okay, uh, so I wanted to see if we could get back to sort of like a bird's eye view of how we think about neuroscience and doing neuroscience, whether you were a cognitive neuroscientist or more a systems neuroscientist and thinking about the, the way that we approach problems in terms of these sort of basic mental terms and, or, or even can think of them as sort of like these primitives, perception, attention memory and language and so on. And you can have some, some general emotion category, motivation and so on, which is the way that we, we see not only textbooks organized, but in many ways, what labs sort of specialize in. So we're the memory lab, we're the, the attention lab, we are the so on lab. And, and, and I wanted to ask your view of how do you, your, your take on, on whether using these kinds of terms that you discuss and you discuss in your book and you discuss today that have this, these long histories and, and have these origins that were in many ways decoupled from understanding complex animal behaviors or even complex uh, human behaviors, uh, that whether using these terms and organizing the space in which we investigate the neural basis of something it benefit from this type of language or we really need to move away from it and sort of maybe reset this 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 uh, this this focus in a way that these terms don't inform the way that we conceptualize our problems and go about trying to solve our problems one of the reasons that i that, that i that i that i that i put this question is is in the sense that it sort of provides a language in which we like to keep things separate from each other then there's language there is attention there's this and these, these these separate things when when we look at the brain we we really see uh, there are multiple ways of looking at what we see at the brain obviously and, and and positions differ quite a bit but we see plenty of evidence for intercommunication inter integration structure of, of large-scale systems like the basal ganglia and, and whatnot that really provide a lot of room for integration of information in a way that would blur all these boundaries that we typically try to separate or perception and cognition are separate and whatnot. So I just wanted to hear your, your take and, and, and whether you think we should, maybe it, it is or isn't time to maybe try to change this vocabulary and, and, make, and that, whether you think that keeping this vocabulary is actually detrimental to our progress or not, or, or you think that's the way to go. Well, what neuroscience can do with this big question is to look at other disciplines. Uh, one good example for me would be genetics, computer science, and physics. 
you know that in physics there was this term atom we still use it the term but we know that doesn't mean undividable uh genes in in genetics so all those things that you know many of these is other disciplines and principles they make up their own vocabulary a new communication system this hasn't really happened in cognitive science or cognitive neuroscience and for a good reason maybe we are too early and so on and i'm not advocating at all to abandon the only way how we can communicate is or communicate well is human speech of course we have to to do that but when we explain something to each other then we have to acknowledge as many of you did including me today that you know, there are big gaps in how i understand and how you understand certain things my favorite thing to pick on today is is this popular term decision making you know, everybody has his own or her or their own uh definitions and i worked very hard for 20 years and i deliver a solution and you said well this is the wrong definition i have a different one now how do we come to a a agreement and there are two ways to do that one is consensus you know i i had this wonderful sentence that i learned from burning man that the dream that we dream together is the truth which is an extraordinarily beautiful sentence but it's exactly totally wrong but that's what we do that you know we dream things together and we say it many times and then it looks like the right thing and this is i think what we scientists have to question and question over and over and over whether those things that we thought explain themselves because this is exactly what happens in many situations that we use the same term as the things to be explained as the things that explains so when we talk about memory memory is a thing but memory is also a engram then memory is a mechanism and memory is a, a a system of the brain and so on and here the precision is 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 not so good so when i publish something you can see all my papers they all use these words in a traditional way because there would be no way that i could write a paper abandoning them but i would say we just have to be more careful and serious whether we take things in like space and time <laughs> and the reason why i started this space and time because those are the unshakable coordinates or axioms of human thinking and if you can I mean Schrodinger made that same point right Schrodinger said look we just happen to be humans that need to think in space and time which is why people preferred his wave mechanics view of things exactly. than others um but you know I just I, I you know just to, to Luigi's point you know and yours I just want to you know I don't understand right in other words navigation you used the word navigation right is navigation a word we should throw out as well because presumably what Christopher Columbus did and what ants do when they're dead reckoning and what the latest plane you know navigation system uses when you land at your favorite airport they're all quite different but we use the word navigation so in other words i just you know i keep finding this critique should we get rid of these words i mean we just have to refine them right so let's get rid of, let's get rid of the word navigation let's get rid of that word let's get yes get rid of to get rid of the word why would i want to get rid of no no but luis is but you know this is the point i made at the beginning of this session is there's a strong way of taking you and then there's a sort of no, weaker, more sensible way because you are putting me into, into a corner no but luis but luis said should you know and he's you know let's get rid of some of these words he's he's right? actually unhappy with my position and yeah you see you couldn't refrain to say like he just couldn't so <laughs> that's what he's doing so in other words what i'm saying is is that is, this is exactly what happens let's get rid of the words like you know well let's get rid of all you know superordinate words they what they do and you're right yuri is these superordinate words they organize our thoughts they help us look at experimental systems they help us begin to narrow the parameter space and we begin to refine and iterate but it is such a straw man to go let's get rid of these words it's just 
it, it, no, of course we can't get rid of them. Don't, yeah. don't throw away anything unless you have a better substitute. That's the fundamental exactly. science. So I, I never ever said that throw away okay. a single word yet. What I'm saying is that when you think about navigation as a good thing and you are looking for mechanisms in the brain and you find something, then do you have to fight with others who says that the same substrate, the same mechanism is in fact is used for other things such as memory? And then, then there is a wake up call for me. I said, wait a second, maybe navigation is a great term, but there is a relationship with another term that I never thought of before. If, if, if I can stop here, that's enough for me. I, why would we throw away things unless we have a better substitute? No theory ever or religion ever was thrown away because of the data contradicting them or observations. That the religion is abandoned only for another religion. Theory is abandoned only if there is a better, more encompassing theory. And that is exactly true for all the definitions of words that we have. Sorry, one second. So can I, I want to maybe right now bring up, so what you're saying is don't throw away any words before you Never. have better words. And so you're not advocating for eliminativism, obviously. So this is not eliminativism. But it should uh, die so by itself. Like we don't talk about the soul. Okay. I cannot get an NIH grant studying the neuroscience of soul or the neuroscience of greediness or many of these things that exist in our brains and, and so on. That's so, fair. I just want to remind you of a question that uh, um, maybe you didn't see it. John uh, Kubi asked in the Ask a Question area. He said, if you think place cells are not about place, how come you still call them place cells, right? So it's true sometimes that I still use the term place cells in spite of the fact that I genuinely, deeply <laughs> believe that it's about processing sequences, but I still use the term place cells because that's a historically um, adopted word that we all know. It refers back to the fact that these cells, how they were discovered, right? Do you, do? You, so I guess it's a question that John asked, which was, why do you still call them place cells if you think it's not about place, which is related to this conversation I feel like that we're having. Um, well, what do you think about that? Part, part of it is that I cannot have a better word, a better substitute. The other one is tradition, tradition, tradition. <laughs> and the third one is respect. You know, the discoverer has the right to keep a term as long as you don't have a much better term. So this well, is the longest one. So uh, these three combinations, uh, that's why I mentioned Atom. You know, Atom is, is, hasn't changed, but its meaning changed tremendously over the past few thousand years. So if we will call place cells, place cells forever, but, in, and we know that they behave like position determining or position correlating uh, units in a particular situation, but not in another situation, we can still call them play cells for convenience. Can I, can I say something? Exactly. Of course, I just want to quickly say that uh, Melanie says that place, um, we use the word place also in a non-physical sequence in a exactly. metaphorical way, it's true. And honestly, the re the it would be great if state space cells rhymed as so well. It does, just doesn't roll off the tongue. If I could, I would call them state space cells as opposed to place cells. But sorry, Luis, go ahead. No, I think I think my point is is a little more subtle. I mean, I think John is painting a picture that I mean is is it very easy to attack, and he he loves to do that. But what I'm trying to say is that words organize the way we we think about things and we structure research programs. So for instance, so let's, let's say that I use words as, as such as um, stages of processing, feed forward, linear, uh, sequential, and so on, and that I organize the way we studied the brain in the 70s along those lines, and someone comes up and says, look, but you know, these words are problematic because we really don't have these stages, these fixed stages in the brain because we have all sorts of ana anatomy that are, uh, are much more distributed, parallel feedback, feed forward, jumping stages and whatnot. So really we should uh, get rid of the word stage. It's, it's, it's not just a, a, a game of, you know, my word is better than your word. It's, it's a way to conceptualize systems in terms of 
frameworks that promote advances in the field. Obviously, this is all personal, right? Because you know, I might think that the best way to think about the brain is a sequential linear device from input to output if this is, I don't know, 1972. So what I'm saying is that, no, it's not that we need to get rid of uh, the words like attention or, or memory or th that's, that's really not, not quite the point. The point is to understand that when we organize our conceptual space in terms of those terms, we're making some commitments of how we think about this system. And if you say that, oh, but I'm really super flexible, you can call it anyway, and I'm going to think of it in 12 different ways because that's how I am. Maybe that's how you are, but if you teach the students in a given certain, given certain ways, and we study these things in the lab in certain ways that don't go in these 12 different ways, then we run the risk of putting ourselves in sort of like conceptual corners that really will not be advancing us very much. So that's more, the debate is about that. It's not about, oh, you know, let's, let's throw out all these things. It's not about that. It's how do we conceptualize the overall picture of, of studying the brain in ways that perhaps move the needle a little bit to one side or the other. So I, I think that at the very least, I know you don't like the, these ideas, but I, I think that you, you need to, uh, it's more nuanced than that, right? So I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, the inside out concept, just to defend myself, is a little bit bigger than the discussion about words and terms. Somehow we seem that we hung up on the words which I care the least amount. I mentioned them as a problem, but that's not what bothers me in every single day in the, in the laboratory. But having said that, think about terms that are very clear, sound very clear in one language, but they are totally different, have a totally different meaning in another language. The decision making for a Hindu is total nonsense. Or pain, for example, there is only one word, one single word in pain in the English language. In Hungarian, there are 17 different ways to say that for for different types of flame, my toothache, for my menstruation pain, and so on. So these are the general things. But again, I don't. This is this is not me. I'm a neurophysiologist. <laughs> I I stumbled into this problem because everybody sooner or later will, if you think about problems deeper and deeper. But that's not the essence of the thing. And there is no program that I'd like to get rid of language or clean the language and so on. I just like to alert people that maybe the terms that you thought were guiding frameworks for your entire research may not be justified perfectly. Thank you so much. So we have 26 questions in the chat and I think we've addressed like a couple of them. So. I will read a couple of them fast, but if, um, if there is anybody on the screen that wants to add something, please uh, add. And then um, if you want to leave, you could leave. And then I could maybe invite a couple of people uh, on. But please go ahead if you have any last thing that you would like to say. And thank you so much for your participation. This has been incredible. Um, thank you all. Thank you. So I will just invite a couple of people in, in case they are still around to ask uh, their questions. And uh, then I will, um, yeah, and then I will read a couple of questions while they're coming on. Okay, so we have a lot of questions. The first one was, the one that has the most votes is, um, Eric Jonas and Conrad Coding wrote the, um, paper, can a neuroscientist understand a microprocessor, arguably using the outside-in approach? Do you think the same paper could be written using your inside-out approach? Certainly better than the outside-in. <laughs> and it's not because I just think it, but I think this is exactly what you try to say. But again, siding with John, it helps a lot if you know what the purpose of this. And this is the crux of, of our problem in neuroscience and the problem in everything that there is it's so easy to understand evolution when you explain it from the point of view of a goal even though we know that evolution has no goal 
there are no laws. There are no laws in nature. There are regularities and so on. But it's so much easier to explain because now all the attempts of evolution can be dismissed and then we have this. So this is exactly the kind of thing that if I know that a TV has to produce a picture, then my engineering approach is my engineering approach will be very very fruitful but if i've never seen a picture generating device and i try to understand it because it's switched off then perhaps never or hardly it's, it's very difficult to understand how the tv works and what, what how it what it does and this is what what they try to do with the, the microchip now if i know that it has to generate something this is the concept that that john is arguing for then it's, it's a little bit easier now with the brain of course is that we don't really know the goals we just believe <laughs> and and without any critic that the, the reason why we have a visual system and we have millions of neurons in the visual system is to make vision possible and then when people in the past five ten years realize that they go to the vision and they record from thousands of neurons and 90% of them have nothing to do with vision but mostly motion they are surprised from the inside out this is not a surprise so of course i don't have a proof because you know it, it, it should be they who should go in and do the experiment again with that inside out <laughs> way uh, maybe it's a little bit better and the question is, you know, sometimes we are lucky. We do a lot of shortcuts in, in, in science. Many of the big discoveries are not through building up pictures from elements, but there are extraordinary insights, such as the place cells. I mean, in that paper, in that paper, right, you know, there's a point in that paper, if I remember correctly, where they say, you know, if we had had some notion of the, of, of the idea of adding, we would have been able to see the configuration of gates and it, that it was an adder. Right. But unless you had some notion of adding, it would be extremely difficult to infer that that thing was doing addition. Yes. Right? It and so again, so again, accusation that I think that I don't need ideas before going to experiment. We do need ideas to go to the experiments. OK. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Hello, Tim. Hi, Tim. Um, hey. Amazing, amazing discussion, amazing talk, Yuri, as always. And um, Happy New Year, Ida and John. Uh, it's uh, nice to see you. It's late over here. I'm, um, I'm, I'm not. Um, I'm in Lisbon, uh, so it's late for me too. Ah, later even. <laughs> Speaking of Lisbon, cosine abstracts is sort of slowly filtering through my. Uh, through, like, it's, it's sorry, Yuri. It's the it's the moment. It's the moment uh, of the year for everyone submitting to cosine. They're just filtering through right now, so I'm just a little bit distracted. <laughs> cool. So I think I don't know why I've been invited on, uh, but um, I, I mean, I think Ida was interested in my take on um, internal versus, out, versus external place cell um, connectivity in in hippocampus. And I mean, I have to say, so firstly, I, I, I'm very interested to know what Yuri, uh, like Yuri, just ignored. Uh, Ida's question about about learning Hungarian. I'm very interested to know the answer to that because, because it seems to me that 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 if you're going to pre-configure the connectivity inside the hippocampus to generate sequences, they have to be generated from a manifold which you, which is likely to be experienced in the real world, right? They just have to be, otherwise they're useless sequences. Um, and so. Uh, which is fine if you're 2D space, you can imagine that place cells come pre-configured with a 2D manifold in there or something like that. Um, uh, it's a little harder to imagine how the manifold for Hungarian is already in Ida's uh, hippocampus before she learns it. Uh, and so I, I, I wonder how you, uh, I mean, I, that's, my, that's my big question when I read your book as well. I mean, and Ida said it better than I could. Uh, I don't know, obviously. <laughs> what I know is that even Hungarian has many rules, mostly the rules of acoustics, which is a framework, how you package information. 
information can be called information only when it can be assigned to a cipher and the cipher is shared between the sender and the receiver. And in every system, without exceptions, I would say, the information is always packaged into chunks. I see. So the, the reason why it is so difficult to learn the Morse code, which I had struggled with when I was a teenager, because we don't know where the space is. And if you know, just have titata or just action potentials and you don't have space, you don't know where the messages end or begin. Now, brain rhythms, which are based on inhibition, provide a natural substrate for packaging this information. And that may be the same rule in every language. And that's why you know, there is a four hertz tempo and there's a little bit faster for the syllables and so, and so on. So and the same rule and all, and the same rule and all. So I mean, so let's just be clear about what you're claiming. Then you're not claiming that well, the then, structure of the world is pre-configured in the brain. You're claiming that there are some tricks the brain uses to uh, to, to 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 make useful sequences to to, to to dissociate sequences into useful chunks that then can induce learning in cortex. Yes, or something like that. Upside down, namely that the the brain didn't generate sequences and rhythms to make eventually human speech possible. But it tried out various things and in a particular niche for particular species, that was useful. And it just happened that in the mammalian evolutionary line, all these things were useful because they had to control a timing, which is typically the body, that this is a skeleton mm -hmm. muscles which have the same myosin, same speed, everything. So this is a, you know, one speculation of that. Now, but I mean, but the, I mean the, the critical question is, I suppose the critical question still is, like we can learn tasks that our evolutionary predecessors never learned, which will require a different structure of sequences, a different pre-configured set of synapses. Um, and so you, it, it can't be possible that you're arguing, I think that the pre, that the, the, the sequences, the, the the set of reasonable sequences for um, for typing on a computer uh, would be pre-configured on our brains. You must be arguing that there's a there's a, a that there's a mechanism in hippocampus that lets us learn that. You must be arguing that surely. No, what I'm I'm arguing is related to that. I would say with the Gibsonian approach that that the the brain allows the, it provides the affordances to do the typing. Mm -hmm. If you won't have that rhythm sequence generator in your brain, your typing could be still possible, but it would be clumsy. And then we have to configure machines that will fit that kind of clumsiness, which would be advantages for that. Ida, you go, and then I'm just going to push one more time after. Yeah, no, it's in the same direction. So, um, uh, if uh, so, Yuri, are you saying that there are some pre-existing kind of universal sequence structures, and what we do when we learn something new is that we find what the relevant kind of the brain figures out what the relevant sequence is and puts the new learned structure into those. So, like basis sets that you can basically. Uh, use a finite number of uh, uh, basis set functions and then uh, make anything that goes on as a com recombination of these ones in different ways? Is that what you're saying? Maybe simpler than that. And you, know, you can say, oh, it, it has been said many, many times before that, that what goes on is that there are different brains that are made, millions of them, just like uh, Eve Mother's, uh, you know, thousands of different uh, potential solutions, and some of them fit better than the others for that particular niche where that animal has to survive. And, and, and the point here is not that the environment makes the brain, but the environment selects the successful uh, structure, pre-configuration of that brain. And, you ah, know, so this is the, so, so. Hang on a second. Oh, you mean over evolutionary time, but you, but also you must mean within moment by moment, right? So, like, I'm, exactly. I'm one. 
I, I'm wandering. I'm wandering around moment by moment, experience some struct some some st uh, structured world, which which is um, of a structure that's an infinitesimally small a, a, a portion of the possible structures there are that the hippocampus might choose to measure. And you're arguing that a sequence that's internally generated from hippocampus can um, can possibly uh, can then just latch onto that structure. And I think I think that so my, my I find it difficult to understand. So, for example, in two D space, right? You need it. We're we're, we're watching. We're we're wandering around two D space, and we come back to the same point again, and we need the same place cell, and so. That means that the structure, the internal structure in the hippocampus, has to have generated the same place at two particular similar times and latched onto it. How, how, if, if that's if that maybe that's possible in two D space, but that's inf that's hugely more complicated. That same argument of trying to understand where you are in a sit in a complicated structural thing. How, how I, I don't think that can be that. There must be something that knows the structure of the world, telling which, telling the place cells which ones to fire when. Uh, okay, it seems so, to me like, like the grid cells in two so D space. We repeat the word sequences, sequences, sequences. Of course, this is just one potential example of how many solutions the brain can have or written. Yeah. These are just two words that I am familiar with and Ida likes. That's why we yeah. talk about this thing. But your circle experiment said funny thing that if you build a seri very simple computational model and said, what is the, what is, how do you make a trajectory? And how do you make infinite trajectories? And this is what I wanted to say for this, uh, the, the connection with AI, that it is a, in at least in a noiseless system, it is the initial condition that determines the entire trajectory. And if the, tra if the initial conditions are different, then those trajectories will be different, orthogonal or not orthogonal to each other. We can change them with a little bit of inhibition and so on. So this was a total surprise to us because when we did the wheel experiment, when the animals had to wait for 15 seconds and run in a wheel between choices, we were astonished that the entire sequential activation could be predicted from the first data cycle. First two but that can't, but so if that's true, how can that then line up with the argument that it maps onto space? Because you, like, when you come back to the same point, you have to go and select one of the ones that you couldn't have known at the initial condition. So that, I mean, that's yeah. so yeah. So the you can say that oh, the way how these sequences are done is that there is an external drive. This is I would I wouldn't say John O'Keefe says that, but basically that's the argument is that there are different things coming out from outside and they determine this every single spike or every mm -hmm. single sequence. What I'm saying yeah. is that it's definitely not the case. I can switch off the light. We can do a lot of manipulations and other things and the sequence don't change. So in complete darkness, there are nice experiments by, by, by Rosa Cossard and others. Complete darkness, the sequences are already there. So they are the affordances that can be attached to a initial point in a circle, and it's inevitable that you come back to the same circle if the if you know your speed and you generate mm -hmm. the same speed. If if the speed is different, then it will be a larger circle. But eventually, you come back to the same part because the whole thing is an attractor. Gotcha. Uh, all right, I'm enjoying this. I'm I'm gonna. Um... Uh, I feel like uh, I feel like I've had my time, and I'm, I'm enjoying this. And uh, hopefully, I've sparked some ideas. And, and nice. But I've, I've seen your uh, eyes were deviating this direction, so there is there are still things that you want to discuss. <laughs> no, 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 I don't. Actually, actually, I, I have to. I have to. Uh, my eyes are deviating. I, so I, um, I, I um, absolutely. Um, there's so many. There's so much of your talk that I totally agree with there's so much of the idea of the packaging of sequences of the of the uh, internalization and there's so much of the idea of uh, effectively affordances in the hippocampal system mm -hmm. which is i think a, an unusual idea a lot of people think about affordances in the motor system but thinking about state affordances effectively what, what is what you're saying um 
uh, that I think is very powerful indeed and really, really neat and it'll be nice to formalize. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I think that that's wonderful. And I, and I um, uh, yeah, I just can't work out how the, in, I, like I love the idea of the internal sequences controlling everything, but I can't work out how it would actually work. Uh, so that's what I was trying to push you on. But if I actually, my wife. One more minute. Just, oh, I see. Okay. Well, yeah. I, actually I want to mention wrong. the basis sets again, but if you have to go, it's fine. But you know what I'm going to say because I'm going to talk about basis. Well, I mean, I, yeah, I basically agree with what Ida's saying, which is that um, you need to construct a structure, and that structure has to constrain the, uh, which base cells uh, happen. Um, I think that's. What, but maybe Ida, you could. I've, I've got to go. Maybe maybe Ida, you <laughs> Thank could. Thank you so um, much for showing up. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Nice to see everybody. Thank, thank you, team, for stopping by. Thanks a lot. So, um, how do I leave the screen? Oh, you can just, uh, yeah. So, I, I think that this is this got very interesting because, as you know, Tim and I both are people who build models of the hippocampus and like you know, uh, navigation, etc. So, I think something John every now and then sneezes with the mic on to. Remind me that we are talking too much. So now I, John, I understand. <laughs> I got the message. Uh, so, so if you think about a Fourier transform, you have some basis sets, and whatever shape the signal has, you have a very limited number of basis sets, and it can kind of figure it out based on what, um, how you uh, express that entire curve on the basis of your, uh, for based on the different parts of the Fourier set, right? Now, similarly, uh, what I understood what you're saying and something that um, we think, some of us think happens is that there could be that there are some basis sets, not in the hippocampus, outside of hippocampus. And they are the ones that kind of um, help to figure out, um, it could be in the internal cortex. And that's how it could be an, uh, uh, pieced together different parts of new experiences but these are uh, using a very simple basis set, just expression of the different kinds of experiences using the same basis set, right? So I'm wondering whether the same way that, you know, imagine the most simple version of it would be if everything was in 1D and we had a Fourier transform and any trajectory in 1D um, or 2D can be kind of like um, expressed with regards to this um, uh, Fourier transform. So. What you're saying, if we wanted to formalize it, is it that there are particular kinds of basis sets, not just for it, but like a lot of different kinds of basis sets and different new things that happen, the hippocampus can express those experiences in terms of these existing um, kind of uh, basis. So in spite of the fact that there are virtually infinite new experiences that it can capture, the number of basis sets that it uses in order to capture those experiences is limited. And many of them you're saying are inborn. I think people like me and Tim are saying they're born, they're learned during lifetime. And uh, we can then discuss where we have it. Is it all inborn or is it um, how much of it is learned and how much of it is inborn? Is that kind of close, uh, a close formalization of what you're saying? I, I have to clarify this. I don't think there is a discrepancy between what I'm saying and what you are saying that what are the bases? Yes, there are elements in the brain, such as trajectories, but they are like, you know, let's say what how far we can go in a gamma cycle, right? It's a short time. So I call though the content of a gamma cycle a neuronal ladder. And then you can concatenate seven plus minus two into a word, a neuronal word and so on. And so when you say, you know, how, what is the combinatorial space? And I say, well, it is like human language where you have only 30 ladders and from 30 ladders with the right combination, with the right grammar, you can describe the entire knowledge of humankind. So that feat is, it exists. So why not? the brain can do something like that, that we just have to find the generative algorithm. And one, the closest to me that I see is the constellation of brain rhythms. Maybe there is something totally different. I don't know. And within that, there are sequences and those sequences are there. So Tim has left already, but 
But when an animal, a, a pup, goes out from the nest for the very first time, the sequence is there already. And it's not there because he can see it. it it's just there. So that's what I call the matching. So there are examples, and you know, George Dragoy was my student who's doing many beautiful experiments along these lines. So this is the kind of thinking that do you have to make your life in an in so difficult in a in a in a, in a network that you dis define every single step of the algorithm, or you just make trajectories and make the tra trajectories flexible. And this is where I say that this is what I think is a more economic system than the Hebbian kind of, uh, of plasticity pulling together everything, every neuron from every corner of the brain. Thank you. This is very illuminating and also kind of inspiring because um, one of my interns that she's going to hopefully be soon our postdoc, uh, we build um, using transformers, you know, things that are akin to um, Gibsonian affordances and maybe an expansion of it. So it would be great to talk at some point later um, about how we could capture this notion of affordances in the hippocampus and this notion of some kind of a basis set or alphabet for uh, different structures and to what extent it's inborn or learned, it would be very interesting to sit down and talk more clearly about those models. John, do you want to say something? You've been quiet for a long time and I feel bad no, about no, it. No, no, I've, I've, been, I've been listening. I mean, again, I feel like there are so many different important points being made here. And, you know, I, I mean, this example, right? I mean, let's say that there are these um, sequential you know, primitives that you can use rather than having to, as Yuri says, start from scratch, synapse by synapse, and, and build it de novo. But either way, that still doesn't answer, once you accept either one of those two positions, how you then construct out of this the phenomena that have those words that some people dislike and others don't. In other words, it, it, it seems to me that this doesn't complete the project you see i guess my question really is is it, it still leaves the big question unanswered which is how do you get these novel functions in their behavioral manifestations out of these different views on how to build them build them up right in other words i, I grant you i mean your general point that there's a lot of preordained structure which can be scaffolded upon right from the get-go okay right okay. in other words there could be a prefabricated church versus building a church brick by brick but let's just have a prefabricated ikea church where you have the naves and the spire pre-built but you still need to come up with the concept of a church and i don't see how these different approaches, the, free, the prefabricated, the preconfigured versus building brick by brick. Those are very interesting questions, but they seem almost orthogonal to understanding how you actually then get these conceptual functional things like a church versus a hotel. Do you see what I'm saying? I don't, I don't see how that difference answers the question of these cognitive concepts. Okay. that's a. Uh charge question i can say only one sentence helen keller you know the name helen keller so blind and deaf and she had generated the same human concepts without any of those inputs that we have she could touch true but touch was an active search and she searched out the mechanisms because the brain was already pre-configured in that human individual pretty much the same way as my brain there's no other answer to that to me and we had uh, marina bedney i agree with you marina bedney we had on two weeks ago and she's done some beautiful work in blind people sort of along the lines of the helen keller that you just did i'm not disagreeing with that idea of space they have the same and of course you can go back to the say everything was evolution and then my yes not everything, but a good chunk of it 
is evolution that constrains the way how we build brains and how we, we look like we are a super smart species, but we are smart to our own niche. Right, but Yuri, what I'm asking is when you said Helen Keller, despite not having the sensory inputs, has similar concepts, that's really interesting. But how do we explain the concepts themselves? How are they made? That's the question. In other words, it's not, I, I agree with what you're saying, but you've used the word only, concepts. You can only think about two ways. One is that we have a human consensus. Humans come together and discuss things and they come up with a agreement. That's, that's one thing. And it's pretty good. What is the other solution? The only other solution is to look at the basis of that communication. Of, the, of that conversation, and that's the brain. There is no other so there, there are no two no no other alternatives. So just to clarify what you're saying is whether it's moving in a straight line or running all the way to having a culturally shared concept, your broad view is that you can take these either through cultural consensus or exploration in the world. But they're all the same basic idea is that these can map onto some form of pre-configured system. And it's the same notion, whether it's culture that you map onto this pre-configured system or locomotion or anything else. In other words, it's, but I feel like that principle is so general and probably true that it doesn't explain the difference that makes a difference, which is what is the fundamental difference between the representation of a concept and a central pattern generator for locomotion. In other words, that difference that makes a difference still has to be explained, even if you're right, that the way those pre-configured circuits map onto the world is the same. So the difference between what you are thinking, perhaps, and what I'm saying is the exact same difference between thinking in evolution or thinking in design. It's exactly the same framework. You said there is no problem. You know, you can have intelligent design or you can have evolution and we got to the same point, but not quite because intelligent design <laughs> is going from the end and assumes that that was a linear event and disregards all the attempts and all the others that were tossed out and i think this is exactly the difference between the inside out and the outside in thinking yeah related to that john roski in the chat he asks what is the type or structure of the grammar that generates that class of neural strings you were talking about that they themselves result into human cognitive categories when exposed to particular environments. So you mentioned what the letters are, which has to do uh, with gamma, for instance, but uh, what he's asking is what are the rules? Well, Where the, are the, the grammar? The grammar is the constellation of brain rhythms, which means cross frequency phase coupling between the different types of rhythms that allows that in a, in a short time, only a small number of neurons can come together because of the finite and slow axon conduction velocities and other time constants in the brain. And these can be communicated to their targets, which can be read. The only goal, and the, 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 the only goal of, of this coalition, the only reason why neurons come together is to discharge a postsynaptic neuron. That's the only message. So from the postsynaptic neurons point of view, that's one unit of information because I spike. Now you can have another message and another message and another message, and they could be sequentially put together. And that sequence could be conceived as a word. So the rules, the temporal rules are already given, but they were not designed for human speech. This is the same rule in the mouse. They were designed for constructing and allowing communication between brain structures. So if a sending structure such as A and the receiving structure such as B 
would like to communicate, it is again, my metaphor is the human centers. B can read out the message from A only until it waits to the end of the sentence because the last word can change the meaning of the sentence. But in order to do this feat, the reader, structure B, should know about the length of the message and the rules of the messages. And this is where brain rhythms come very effective and useful because they are coherent and they work coherently across structures from moment to moment. I don't know if I made it clear enough. This is not an explanation of the language, of course, but it's an explanation how things in language can be concatenated and put into uh, temporal structures. Right. I think Chris McDonald asked you a question that was related in, uh, with regards to John's idea of long sequences. Um, for instance, uh, time scales, etc. So what you're saying could work for shorter time scales. What and what they are asking is rules for longer, uh, larger um, sequences, uh, longer time scales, and more abstraction. What do you think of those? Is there any of those that you think are learned and are not innate, and or you think that whatever is learned, there is some kind of component that exists already that um, the learning appropriates that. So that's a super interesting question. You know, there are there are very long rhythms, and they are all related. They are rhythms that are twenty second long, and and then fifty second long, and so on. Maybe that's the solution. I doubt because those long rhythms are not inhibition based anymore. But the sequences that are can be generated are perhaps infinite in length. So imagine that an animal is going from New York to Boston, along the way, every neuron in the CA1 pyramidal, uh, uh, in the CA1 region, will be a place cell somewhere along the road. And that's a long sequence. And if it's a continuous movement, which is difficult to accomplish, of course, there will be one long sequence. So the, the brain can accomplish that if it is needed. But uh, another solution is that these things that said, what is long and what is short is of course on a linear scale a day and a year or a minute and a day look very very different but as i said from the beginning the, the brain seems to be organized in a log scale and a day and a year on log scale is only a few units uh, the third solution to this or third answer to this question is that you don't think even if you are telling your life story it's not a continuous thing. It is in your long-term memory, but for the moment, only a very small fraction of that memory comes to surface. It's a small chunk, which is, you know, we, we, we call it working memory. It's a very small chunk. And then that small chunk is like a shift register is being moved by the next chunk of information that comes in because one can call up the next. So there are, and, the, the, and there are uh, illustrated mechanisms in uh, neuroscience or neurophysiology that allow this to happen. Whether this is the right solution, I don't know, but I don't know other solutions either. Thank you for that great uh, answer. I will read a couple of questions very quickly because I feel like we have really, um, we had 27 questions. So I just want to make sure at least I ask a couple of them. Um, <coughs> <laughs> Maximilian Hoffman says, thanks for the talk and the great book. Uh, as I understand, you advocate your approaches as inside out because you suggest that neural sequences somehow should be treated as internal action, internal neural, diction neural dictionaries, and therefore can be grounded. What do you mean by internal action? How could we hope to investigate or isolate such an action within the brain? Would this be similar to Mark Bickard's interactivism? So internal action is, you can call it contemplation, or even with larger words, you can call it thinking. So when in a simple organism, the animal has to figure out whether it goes left or right, it can use various uh, cues to do that. Internally, the brain can ask other targets, ask, um, compute certain things that 
should I do that? Should I do that? Or should I do this? Should I do that? And so on. And then it comes to some sort of a consensus within itself. And this is what I call internally organized uh, or internalized uh, sequence. But it's not very different from the same sequence that is being matched to the external one. This is where the, <laughs> the, the discussion comes back again and again to the, the same problem that we don't make these sequences for the external and internal separately. They are the same things, and this is why I use the navigation and memory as good examples of this externalization or internalization of brain function. He also asked, how do you individuate and measure one such internal action? Say it again. Uh, how do you individuate and measure a given internal action? Well, I can measure it by reading out later in humans with with this is what people do typically by asking the person or making a a readout or an animal whether the animal did the right uh, action for example when we are recording from large number of neurons in the hippocampus and we ask the animal to wait for 20 seconds before it makes a decision or action then in the first 10 well let's say one second we can already predict what's coming 20 seconds later. And the readout is nothing else, just the sequence uh, or, or, or the, the phase relationship of the neurons to hippocampal theta cycles. And we can tell with very high precision which direction the animal will turn in the future, down the road, 20 seconds later, including the errors. So there are ways to monitor the activity and there are ways to read out the consequences of this readout. And how do you, what is the smallest unit of an action? So uh, what you said is fantastic, a readout from the, you know, the recording, but uh, what is the quantum, what is the unit of action? What is the smallest uh, of this internal action that you have in it? An action potential. Thank you so much. So the, action, uh, if the reason why a neuron fires an action potential because it reads the depolarization, hyperpolarization uh, negotiation from its inputs. Well, I'm sorry. I just want to ask Ida. I, yeah, Yuri, that that result is so interesting. You know, this point that you can predict 20 seconds before what the animal is going to do and the errors. And I just want to understand what the implication of that is. Does that mean? that the behavior actually began 20 seconds before and is just playing out over its time scale. In other words, you basically, a lot of the behavior is, the, is underneath the, the, the water surface and the final behavior is the tip of the iceberg, but it began 20 seconds before. What, 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 what does that 20 second runway actually mean? Oh, that's very simple. Namely, as I mentioned, in a, in a model that we built, you can determine or you can predict the evolution of a trajectory seconds, tens of seconds, or even longer from the initial condition. Now, the reason why we are so good in this experiment is because the problem is simplified between left and right. And because the design of the experiment that we made the animal to run in the same direction all the time and with relatively the same speed. So we have done everything in our power to make sure that the external world is not perturbing the system. And that is the reason why the trajectory is always the same. Now, why is it the same? It's because the trajectory is built up or can be built up only from the point of the previous reward. When the animal is rewarded, this is when it's making up its plan, if you want, the sequence for a new goal. And from the moment of the reinforcement, the sequence goes exactly the same way from the water to the wheel, 20 seconds in the wheel, down the road on the middle arm, and to the right or to the left. So isn't that really, so just so I understand it, given the constraints of the experiment, the fact that the reward resets the behavior from that moment, okay. that basically you've, you've sort of imposed stereotypy. Yes, yes. So, so isn't that, so how informative is the imposition of stereotypy 
in terms of more free, open-ended behaviors? Okay, so that's a good question. So if the open-ended behavior would be free will, you know, it's late in the night, so we can talk about these things, that would be totally random and there would be no regularity in our life, then it would be nonsense. However, we have many, many constraints and many, many regularities. So when you are coming to any situation, that situation is already tunes your brain to certain affordances or certain possibilities and that it simplifies what kind of sequences would be available for this. So the better experiment would be in our hands would be to have a radial arm maze, right? Where there would be eight different readouts, not only two. And, and then you ask, you no, know, we have at least every human has at least 50 to 60,000 uh, uh, episodes. Then how do we find the 60,000 episodes? But you can prime this. And the priming mechanism is probably the hippocampal sharp wave ripple that we know because of various reasons. So this priming, which is happening in a, in a subconscious mind, is that is constraining what kind of sequences will be brought up to the surface of, uh, of working memory. This is all hand waving, but extrapolation from that experiment that I just explained to the level of possibilities. And there is nothing that tells me that this is not a possible route. So in a, in a way, if I understood another way to say what you've said, which is fascinating, is you had a slightly limited sort of either or scenario with stereotypy, but this is how context might work. Okay, I, you finish the sentence. <laughs> is that how context might work? I mean, context. context. Yeah, 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 sorry. Okay, yes, yes. So context might be doing that initialization. Yes, without, without knowing what context is, because I don't exactly know. But something like that, something that's a good concept, which we've known for a long time, that once you have a, a context that already eliminates many, 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 many options. Precisely, exactly, exactly. It, it, it primes. Exactly. So we agree on one thing at least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like this is cause for celebration. I'll just read like maybe two more questions if that's okay. Um, quickly. So Alan, uh, who couldn't get online for because their internet wasn't working, says, I see many parallels between Gibson's idea of perceptual learning as differentiation and Dr. Bujaki's approach to learning. Can you speak about this connection a little more? Uh, so there is nothing new under the sun. There is no new idea. <laughs> and uh, you know, Gibson has done an enormous favor. It's not only introducing something, but it's one thing to introduce something. The other one is to hammer it in to the minds of people. You know, I would say a bigger person than, than, uh, than Gibson was uh, von Oekskuhl. Von Oekskuhl was a German behaviorist. He said everything, what Gibson said, everything. But in a very complicated language, <laughs> it's, it's even for Germans, it's incomprehensible in many cases. And, and he uses, invented so many words and so on. But it was basically the same thing, that the animal is living in its niche. And then, of course, you can go back, and, and I mentioned already Plato. So you, what we do in science is that we revisit ideas in a new context, and we make it, and make it more explicit in the present context. It's like reconsolidating the information. You bring it up something that was known, but then you mix it up with the presence, and then a slightly different picture comes out. So I have a great respect to Gibson. He never ever thought about the mention, even the, the word hippocampus. He didn't know anything about sequences and so on. But the framework, you can say, is, uh, yes, is there. You, you already mentioned a couple of, uh, of you know, the brain in the body philosophers. They tell you a lot of things. They, they don't tell you anything about sequences in the hippocampus. Exactly. I think they, they just uh, were more interested in your take, uh, not to reduce from uh, your kind of work. So, um, um, what make, uh, so this is a question from Gion. 
They ask what mechanisms determine which pre-configured pattern is selected at a given moment? How does the brain avoid overwriting? Uh, so in every situation, as we agreed with John, <laughs> You know, simplifies the realm of possibilities. And every single situation, you have your brain in a particular state. And that particular state is already priming what kind of available sequences or access to those sequences are. So when you ask me the right time, I can, and the right question, I can give you an intelligent answer. But as you have witnessed already over the past hour, sometimes I gave you terrible answers. And it's because when I ask you certain questions such as, what is, what is the capital of Mongolia? <laughs> then you can right away say, leave me alone. I have no clue. Do long the tour. Yeah, there we go. So there are, there are these two options but there is a third possibility which is john would say ah, shish, i don't know but i know i should know and then in the elevator it pops up so that pop up is a example of that that people call priming in the cognitive literature and this is what i call you know subconscious uh, priming with the sharp wave ripples that it gives a limited options of kind of thing is and if the limited options are the right thing then john says Ulaanbaatar. if he was in a different state he would say mm. or the, or my question was a little bit more difficult let's say upper volta <laughs> in oh, do go? there we go <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Okay. I'm, the, I'm a nightmare, I know, sorry. <laughs> but you could see that he took at least two times longer. So the computation is, and the context and so on, and they already primed him because we were asking about capitals. So that's already, uh, and so this is the short answer to this complicated question that it's, it's not random, it's not precise, but most of them is good enough. And this is what the last chapter in my book is that, you know, good enough answers of the brain are the best answers. I just ask one Thank more. You, just, I just, just, you know, because it's getting late. Right. And so I just want to try to wrap up, Yuri, because, you know, we don't get a chance that, that, you know, this is an incredible luxury to have you for this long and everyone asking you questions. Um, so I just want to, you know, going all the way back to what Luis Pessoa, when he asked his question, he thinks I gave him a hard time, but I didn't really. But that, what do you think this means? for cognitive neuroscience. In other words, I, I'm just interested to know, you know, I think Ida and I are very interested in cognitive neuroscience and, and human behavior. And, and then you're coming from doing work in, in, in animal models and your view. So if you, what does this mean programmatically as sort of as a scientific program now, if one wanted to do cognitive neuroscience? I, you're not saying that cognition itself is a kind of side effect or myth or construct that, you know, the stuff that we're doing right now in this salon is just some sort of higher level sensory motor behavior. I mean, I just want to know how we get to cognition from your framework. What would you do, just so I know? In other words, am I missing something or are you saying that, you know, it's, it's a, it's a manufactured complexity that if we understand simpler sensory motor behaviors and animal models, it's not gonna be a big jump to what other people call higher cognition. I, I'm just trying to understand if we took you completely at your word and there's so much that we should, what does this mean for the scientific neuroscience project? So, you know, you can reset and we start a conversation from the beginning because then I would fire back and said, John, please define cognition. And then uh, you can go from social cognition from the very high level to the simple cognition and so on. But there are, but so, there are always, but that's true, Yuri, but there are always two ways to deal with these kind of things. So, so consciousness. My, my point here is that there are different levels of investigations and there are different 
explanations. And you can say, how do you dare to say a simple word and relate it to cognition when you never really studied anything like I do? Because you I, always... I wasn't saying, I wasn't actually saying anything like that. I'm genuinely asking, you know, there are always these two options when it comes to these kind of conversations. One is, is that, you know, from William James, you know, we just inherited notions that seem complex and real, but they're actually illusory and they should really be explained away. Or they are real, more complex phenomena that are internal. And we do want to explain them, but there's a way to get there. Now, sometimes I can't decide whether there's the sort of eliminationist view that we don't need these higher level concepts and they've just deluded us. Or there's a way to do science from the inside out that can get us there. And I can't quite decide from your program, are you sort of just explaining away, dismissing, decomplexifying, or are you saying that there is a road to these phenomena because they're real? So explaining away never worked in any science. And my claim is that we are doing a lot of explaining away. And my roadmap is to explain. Right. So what would you, what, what sort of behavioral phenomena would you be interested in studying next? In other words, do you feel that there's a complexity ladder that you're going to try and do? For example, like the, the, the example we had before from stereotypy left, right to more open-ended behaviors, so longer there horizon are, planning. There are, you know, it's giant big things, you know, how would I design cognitive neuroscience from scratch or how would I fund certain things that these are different levels of thinking but let's start with a simple one so for example when today somebody wants to study uh neuroscience of greediness it won't get funding <laughs> because everybody knows that it's not there yet and this is not a real thing but somehow when it, you 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 want to study decision making then every second application is about decision making so much so that NIH changed the learning and memory section into learning and memory and decision making. So maybe my contribution would be to say before you decide that I want to devote my entire life to decision making or when I devote my entire life to attention, because that's a famous phrase from uh, from from um, William James, you know that how do I know that I'm investing into the right thing. So before you invest, make an agreement with yourself that I know the limitations of this. We all know what decision making is, but do we really know when it comes to understanding the, the brain mechanisms? So if every young individual who comes to neuroscience reads my book and thinks about it for half an hour, maybe an hour, that's enough for me. Gone for, I think we've gone three hours. I, yes, I think we, we have, have. Let poor Yuri That's go. That's what I was going to say. A, yeah. I think that I think this may well be a, a record-breaking salon. Right? <laughs> we have gone um, until seven twenty once. So yeah, just, and the number of questions. You know, this is what yeah, happens. Yeah, the number of questions are, definitely is record-breaking. We've never had twenty-seven but, questions before. Also, we had a tiny poll, Yuri, and we asked people, "Does the brain work?" 56% said inside out, 2.6% said outside in, 7.7% .7 said middle out, and 33.3% said all of the above. <laughs> so there you've definitely go. changed people's minds. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have the last word, which is a joke. You know, how to end a salon. So in a Hungarian, I've been in a salon somewhere in, in, in Europe, the way how a English person says goodbye, that he just disappears without saying goodbye. This characterizes all Englishmen. The Hungarian says goodbye 10 times and never leaves. <laughs> also the Iranians, they also- <laughs> Three hours. <laughs> I, I actually think the name, I think the name for leaving without saying goodbye is it's called a French exit. <laughs> I thought, sorry, isn't it the Irish goodbye? Yeah, yeah. 
Well, listen, I'm going to make a French, I'm going to make a Hungarian exit. Goodbye, goodbye, <laughs> goodbye. And Yuri, um, thank you so thank much. You guys. We're, we're deeply Such grateful. A pleasure. All right. Thank you. Take care, Take care guys. Bye. 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 Thank you.